Hello, everybody. I just told myself to calm down that nobody's tuning in. So I'll get started in one second. Actually, I'm going to start with some uh, overview of just how the chat's going to go. So let me get myself off of here. So some people in the past have complained that the chat goes by too quick because too many people show up. So I have it in slow mode. So you're going to have to wait 45 seconds between each message that you send. Hopefully that's going to slow it down. Also, I made it for subscribers only for, they have to be joined for 30 minutes. Not that I'm looking for subscribers, but it just prevents trolls and other people who just see a live chat on YouTube and try to spam and do stuff like that. Also, please be polite to others. Just because we have different opinions and theories does not mean that we have to hate each other or be jerks. So just please be polite to other, other people. Like I said, don't hate other people who have different theories because online, it seems like some people are so, I don't know, like aggressive for anybody who doesn't believe what they believe. I'm not acting like I have the answers to everything. So I want to hear what other people have to say. So just be polite to other people. There are a lot of comments. If you've been here before, you know, one of my sayings is, sorry, I'm like 30 minutes behind on comments. So this chat, we're going to go until I can say, sorry, I'm one day behind on chat or on comments. Actually, it's going to be three hours. We'll see, we'll see how it ends up. There's not that much to talk about. So if you want to go watch Gray Hughes live chat, go do that. If I do not highlight your comment, it does not mean that I disagree with you or I dislike you. There's just so many comments. In the top left of your chat, it defaults to top chat, but you can change that. If you click it, you can do live chat to see all the comments. Like I just said, the chat might last three hours. We'll, we'll see how that happens. I've never banned anybody in chat because I do not use the YouTube interface. I have to use StreamYard. So if you get banned, it means one of my mod moderators thought you were a clown who ran away from the circus. So if you get banned, it's because you wrote something ridiculous. I try not to curse, but I can't promise anything. So if you have kids, tell them to go to bed or something. <laughs> Finally, the tone of the chat. Obviously, we're talking about the Delphi murders, which is extremely sad. And I think most of us have spent hundreds or thousands of hours by ourselves, like looking into this case, and it's so sad. So I sometimes have some sarcastic comments during live chats. So I just want to make sure, like, I don't think this is funny, but I can't help making ridiculous comments sometimes. So, <laughs> so my agenda for today, I have not done a live chat for two months. Yay. Um, and my next public live chat will probably be another two months. We'll, we'll get to that later. So I'm going to start with some photos that most of you, most of you probably have not seen. And then I will review all the latest court filings since my last live chat around mid June. Everybody's favorite Keg and Klein got sentenced to about 43 years. I'll get to that later. Plus some various other things. Let me drink from my taco cup and then I'll come on camera real quick and say hi to people. Hi people, is that good enough? Let me just say hi to a couple people. Thank you everybody for joining, especially people. Oh my gosh, I almost, I almost forgot. People in Europe who are staying up late. So in my last live chat, there was a woman from Poland. I said hi to my people in Poland, but apparently I only have one peep in Poland. And her name, last time I tried to pronounce it as Malgorzada. So I actually studied this and it's going to sound ridiculous and I'll embarrass myself, but I'm trying to be polite and get redemption for my peep in Poland. So I looked online and here's what I'm going to say with a really bad accent. Oh my gosh, this is going to be embarrassing. Dobry. Well, I, I, I have to do it faster. Dobry V. No, Tom, faster. I should have practiced it a lot more. Okay. Dobry V. Etcher Malgorzata. That means good evening, Malgorzata. That's her first name. So maybe next time in two months, I'll get better. She's probably sleeping. Hi, Wom Tepster. Oh, let me highlight these things. Hi, Wom. Uh, hi, Melanie. Thank you. Hi, analysis of a crime. 
I'm ready to ramble to trigger you. Who else do we have here? Yeah, I can't um, do the emojis, but thank you for your emojis. Hi, everybody in Australia, Europe, the US. Hi, Deb's True Crime Notebook. I just posted her link to her YouTube channel. You guys can check it out. She does a lot of coverage on Delphi. Anytime something happens, she does a short or a community post, usually the same day. So she's a good person to follow. Sorry, I'm going to get to this real quick because a lot of people hate when people do live chats and it takes 99 minutes to start talking about what we're here to talk about, which is Delphi. Hi, Emily. I feel bad not saying hi. To hi, everybody. I am going to start now and show you some interesting pictures of Rick that you probably have not seen. So uh, just one quick thing. Previously, if you've seen my live chats, I would have like a tropical or whatever ocean behind me. And I those were my vacation pictures from helping my uncle out on Maui. And those photos were all from the Lahaina area right on Front Street there, which I'm sure most of you have seen was totally decimated by fire. So I don't know, it's just too sad to include those pictures. So I changed my background to Squamish, Canada, which is in, it's like an hour from Vancouver. So I was up this high. Oh my gosh. Anyway, <laughs> uh oh, first Tom laugh of the night. All right, what am I showing? I'm showing a picture of stop screen. Somebody previously said, I cannot say hold on because it's rude. So please hold a minute. Here we go. That is the first picture I've ever seen of Rick actually happy and smiling. So where is this from? Thank you to the person who shared this um, and also the person who shared some stuff that I'm going to show in a second. This is from an escape room. For those of you who don't know what an escape room is, in the US, like these companies, usually they're in like strip malls or something like that. And they'll have maybe two to four rooms where you choose a theme and you get like 60 minutes to look for clues in the room to try and escape. So Rick, this is a photo that somebody found of Rick and five of his family members. So Rick is in the back row, top left. And I cropped out everybody else because I want to respect their privacy, but I will tell you kind of who was there. So Rick was in the top left. In the middle top was his son-in-law who's married to his daughter. And on the top right, I believe it was Rick's stepfather. On the bottom left and the bottom right were two children about 10 years old. That's why I like cropped that, painted over those that kid's face for his privacy. Um, and in the middle bottom was a guy around 50. I'm not sure who those three people were on the bottom. So after you finish the escape room, they have these different signs that people hold up based on whether you successfully got out or you did not. So Rick is holding up, I'm a genius and so close. So, I mean, can you be a genius and not get out? I don't know, maybe Westfield needs to mark down that Rick has experience escaping. Uh -oh, sarcasm. Okay, so... What else about this picture? Other, let me zoom in so you guys can see his teeth. Not that you really care, but we've never really seen. This is weird zooming in on his pic, on his face, but we've never seen a picture of Rick's teeth other than there was that one photo of him like giving like a whatever heavy metal gang symbol or something. <laughs> but this is the first picture where he's smiling and you can see his teeth. Other than that. The only other noticeable thing or notable thing is if you saw in the document that was released of what they took from Rick's house, they took a lot of his sweatshirts and jeans and stuff. And one of the sweatshirts was listed as Fox, F-O-X, which I believe is a car racing company or something like that. So I believe be behind this kid's head is the word Fox, F-O-X. And I believe because of the green, it's um, some kind of like, if you see up here, it's Monster Energy Drink. And it might have been some kind of uh, collaboration between Fox and Monster Energy, which is why this is like a lime green. I do not believe this was the sweatshirt that Rick was wearing that day. So let me, I'm going to try and keep up with comments more this time um, instead of falling so far behind. I'm going to stop sharing that. 
and I'm going to share some other interesting pictures that most of you have not seen. Please hold a moment. Which one am I going to show first? Uh, let's see. Give me one second. Okay. I'm working behind the scenes. So I'm going to show you about like four different pictures. So share. What's this? This is the CVS in Delphi. And thank you to the person who shared this. Uh, apparently this building, the CVS is for sale. And so somebody found that out and they found the listing, which is these photos are from a drone from around August, 2022. So two months before Rick was arrested this like real estate, real estate company flew a drone over here and they only have photos. They do not have video. So why is this important? I'm about to show you. That's the wrong thing to push. Hold on. Rick's car is parked down here in the bottom left. I believe I'll, I'll show you some more in a second. Hold on. Or please hold the moment. <laughs> so Rick has a 2016, Ford Focus ST model. And if you remember before, the only real picture we've seen of it was when his car was towed on October 13th when his house had raided. And so this is a far away view. Unfortunately, it's not that good of a view, but I have one other or two other photos to share. So that's one view of his car. And I'll get more into detail about backing that thing up into the parking spot. Oh, we have to open this one. So next, I'm going to show you another zoom. And then there's one more photo after that. Sorry, I'm not looking at the chat, really. So <laughs> talk amongst amongst yourselves. OK, so I made this. Obviously, there's not a car in the grass. So here I took the photo of Rick's car being towed. So you can see it has um, like the darker hubcaps and wheels which I do believe that means that it's Rick's car parked at CVS uh, Delphi. Down here, I looked online, and this is a 2016 Ford Focus ST. Obviously, it has different hubcaps or rims or whatever, but I just wanted to give people an idea of Rick's car. This is what it looks like. And I guess I'll talk about this now. So we've talked about um, Rick supposedly backed in his car at the CPS parking lot and witness four said she drove by and she thought it was kind of suspicious that maybe he was trying to uh, conceal his license plate. If he was up to something no good that day in Indiana, they do not need a front license plate. I I've shown pictures before where I kind of like showed the CPS, the CPS parking lot with a Ford focus backed in. It was, it was not Rick's Ford focus, but I tried to give an idea of what was, what it would have looked like, looked like, sorry. So if you remember my evidence against Rick uh, video, I talked about exculpatory and inculpatory evidence. And my way of trying to remember which is which is exculpatory means it excuses somebody or the defendant from going to jail. So that's you want as a defendant and Rick wants to have a lot of exculpatory evidence. Inculpatory evidence means you in danger, girl, you're going to go in jail because it's not good for you. So people have debated, is Rick parking his car backwards at CPS inculpatory or exculpatory evidence? And it seems like a general thing that he does at work is to back his car in. So I don't know that it necessarily means that Rick was up to no good. Well, that's a whole other issue. But I just wanted to show that he did, I guess, in some circumstances at work, reverse his car. One more picture for here, and then I'll get to my PowerPoint slides. Hi, everybody else who has joined. I'm not looking at how many people are watching right now. <laughs> so there was, was this one other photo that's very interesting. For people who just joined, this is from August 2022, Rick, the CV, CVS in Delphi, where Rick worked present. So here is the outside. 
and we'll just do this near CVS and uh oh who's that that's Rick as far as I can see he has very short hair it looks like it might be his long long goatee his short legs and those feet are no offense but they're small and I don't know I think a lot of you think that bridge guy's feet are also small I don't know you guys can make up your own mind whether you think this body matches bridge guy but I, I thought this was very interesting so thank you to the person who shared it um give me one second after look at my phone <laughs> fig solves hi I wonder if Rick started backing his car in backwards after the murders, just in case someone came forward with his plate number at some point. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't, I don't think it's necessarily like guilty that he backed his car in at C, uh, CPS and CVS. I'm um, just looking at some of your comments to see before I move on to my PowerPoint slides with the latest updates for legal documents. Yeah, so some people, hi, digital. I'll say hi to everybody as I highlight your comments. Um, were the older model PT cruisers shorter and curvier and the newer models longer and more boxy? I do not know. Obviously we heard or we read in the PCA that some people driving by described the car at CPS as being a purple PT cruiser a small SUV or a smart car. I don't think that it's that suspicious that people gave these various descriptions because they're driving on route or the road 300, I don't know, like 30 to 40 miles an hour. And also on Hoosier Heartland Highway, they're driving like 55 to 60 miles an hour. So I say that I think that the Ford Focus ST design is not a standard sedan looking model. So I could see how somebody could say, oh, it looked like a PT cruiser, which is not a standard car. A small SUV is not really standard and a smart car is not really stand standard. So I don't, I'm not really too concerned that people gave various descriptions for the car parked at CPS. Cause I believe it was Rick. Cause it just does not make any sense that Rick would have parked anywhere else and still passed the juveniles, which we'll get to that later. Hi, F Zappa 20. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And also Georgina, I appreciate it. Thank you. Just some few more comments before I move on. Hi, Teresa. Teresa, are you the one who said 7,400 people in your family are watching this just to make me more nervous? Uh, Teresa agrees with me. Wow, that's impressive. Most people disagree. Some people just like to back in maybe to make a quick getaway. Well, I think a lot of people do back in because in some of these uh, situations, you can't pull forward. So you're going to have to back it up as when you leave. So it's just quicker to do it uh, when you arrive. So I don't think it's that uh, guilty that he backed into CP CPS. Hi, Dave. Rick's weight fluctuation could be a sign of alcohol abuse. In one of my videos, I showed nine different photos of Rick and he definitely, his uh, appearance did change and he has gained weight over the years and apparently lost it recently. Hi, Meerkat. I could easily see someone mistaking that as a PT cruiser. Hi, Charmaine. If we remember the picture of Rick posing for a picture with a sketch of young bridge guy in the background, Looks like maybe the same style goatee here. I agree. It's really bl uh, blurry as I zoom in even further, but I'm pretty sure that is Rick because it looks like he has um, a, I don't know if people at CVS who work there maybe have like a card that they wear around their, their neck. Deb's True Crime Notebook. We saw his car in the CVS parking lot and it was not backed in. So it doesn't seem like it's his habit. What, what are you talking about? I don't remember Rick's car being in the CVS parking lot. Uh-oh, Deb, what are you talking about? 
Hi, Marshall. Thank you. Nice to see you. Yes, my uncle lives on the east side of Maui and the Lahaina fires were on the west side. So thank you. Hi, Babu's Frick. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you freak. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll move on to the next, my lovely PowerPoint slides in a second. Comrade Ballin, that's the first time I've seen you here. Hi, welcome. They teach you to park like that as an EMT because it's safer. All right, thank you. Um, Deb says, you just showed his car, Tom. Yeah, but he backed it in. I don't know. We'll move on with our lives. <laughs> All right, uh, what am I doing next here? I'm going to review the latest... I'm going to review my PowerPoint slides with the latest legal filings since my last public live chat, because some people say they don't follow the case every day. So I do these live chats to try and be nice and keep people updated with what's going on. So I'm going to talk for the next 10 minutes or so, unfortunately, for the next three hours with some updates here. So I'm not going to look at comments, so I'm going to just start reading this stuff. So June 16th, filed by Judge Gull, an order was issued. Defendant's motion for order on continuing disclosure of defendant's mental health records. Court grants motion and orders the Indiana Department of Correction and or any other departments, law enforcement agencies, and or individuals assuming jurisdiction over the care and custody of Rick to release to attorneys Rosie and Baldwin, upon the written request or either any and all mental health records associated with Rick without the necessity of the execution of consents and or waivers by Rick or his public defenders. So the summary of that is that the defense team gets easy access to Rick's future mental health records. On June 19th, four-party Indiana Department of Correction appearance filed appearance by these two attorneys who I believe work in the attorney general's office, which I just said here, summary, lawyers for the attorney general's office acting on behalf of the Indiana Department of Correction, uh, because the defense asked for some documents from Indiana Department of Correction, and so the attorney general represented them. June 19th, filed by Indiana Department of Correction, motion to quash subpoena or enter protective order, Westville did not want to allow the defense to inspect Rick's jail cell. So that was June 19th, and it was decided a month later on July 18th by Judge Gull. Order issued. The court, having reviewed the Indiana Department of Corrections motion to quash subpoena or enter protective order, now finds that the defendant's request is unreasonable and oppressive and beyond the scope of discovery. The court, therefore, quashes the subpoena and requests for production to non-party issued by counsel on May 19th, 2023. Uh, June 20th, it was a very short entry. It said it was filed by Carroll County Sheriff's Department, document filed, but no description. June 29th, filed by the defense. It said motion for order on visitation with inmate, and it did not dis uh, disclose which inmate. It seems somewhat obvious that it could have been this Robert Baston guy, which if you've been keeping up with the case, I did talk about this in one of my previous live chats. He's some guy who has a history of complaining, I shouldn't say complaining, but we'll say complaining, about treatment in Westville and various prisons within Indiana. This guy, Robert Baston, molested a nine-year-old nine -year -old girl at a party, and I don't know that we should really trust what he has to say, but I guess he wrote a letter previously before the June, the last June court date that Rick was in court. He wrote a letter to the defense, I believe, saying that um, other inmates are taunting Rick, the jail guards are taunting Rick, and some other complaints about just the overall Westville facility. So Ju July 5th, correspondence two from the court filed. Westville correctional inmate letter. So it seems like the defense and this guy were kind of trying to communicate for maybe the defense team to talk to him in person. I have not seen any updates uh, since this. 
Hi, Nolan. Thank you very much. Please give to Tom and the <laughs> the Tobe Lesenby Mustache Fund. Help Tobe grow it out or shave it back. Soul patch. We need change in Carroll County. Thank you. <laughs> Moving along. Thank you, Nolan. All right. Here's a long one. July 19th, order issued, filed by Judge Gull. The court, having had this matter under advisement following a hearing and considered the evidence and arguments of counsel, now finds as follows. So this is my summary because it was kind of long and confusing. Defendant is incarcerated at Westville under a quote unquote safekeeping order. The court order states that the court, quote, finds that defendant is an inmate awaiting trial and is in imminent danger of serious bodily injury or death or represents a substantial threat to the safety of others, end quote. The evidence presented by the defense at the hearing on defendant's motion to reconsider the safekeeping order did not support many of the allegations advanced by defendant counsel. In fact, the evidence presented demonstrated that the defendant is treated more favorably than other inmates housed at Westville. So this was the June, whatever, I forget the date, the June hearing where Rick was in person and also the Westville warden pretty much said that the defense team flat out lied for like six or seven other quote unquote allegations. Court has reconsidered the safekeeping order and finds it reasonable and necessary to ensure the defendant's safety and to prevent serious bodily injury to himself. The Department of Correction has provided and will continue to provide defendant with the necessary medical and mental health services. If the Department of Correction believes a facility other than Westville is more appropriate or more convenient for counsel to not have to drive 90 minutes one way, the court is confident that the Department of Correction will move the defendant accordingly. So they've been going back and forth. It seems like a hell of a long time trying to get Rick moved from Westville to Cass County Jail. I'm sure you guys are all like up to date with this, but I know the defense team said a few months ago, we're spending all of our time trying to get Rick out of Westville, which hmm, I don't know, maybe you need to spend time on some other stuff. Drink from my Taco Bell cup. Hold on, drink. Everybody take a drink. <laughs> okay, this is the last PowerPoint slide of legal updates. And then I'll look at your comments if you have anything about these legal updates before I get into other stuff. So August 8th was the last update that I saw filed by the defense. I looked online and this word I think is pronounced precipi for transcript to Allen County court reporter and felony judicial assistant. It was based on the June 15th hearing on the safekeeping order, which was when Rick was last in court. And so I don't know exactly why they want this, this exact detail in court reporter's transcript from that hearing. Like I wrote here, did they want the Westville warden's testimony to appeal the safekeeping order yet again? I looked online just for a quick definition for people who don't know, which I did not know. A precipi is a legal writ commanding a person to do something or to appear and show cause why he or she should not. It can also be written, sorry, it can also be a written order from a party to a clerk or judge to issue a writ of execution or other legal action. So that's the end of my legal updates. Let me look at your comments to see what you guys are talking about. Hold on, I, I don't know who you're talking, oh, sorry. Please wait a moment. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who you're talking about. Deb's, Deb's True Crime Notebook said, I have heard he's doing better now and doing some talking. Are you talking about Rick or somebody else? Deb says, Robert Baskin is also a jail snitch. Don't mess with Deb in jail. Hi, rescue all the dogs, nice to see you. Hi, Aurora007. It is suspicious that the defense were not allowed to make sure that Rick's rights are being violated, which is essentially their, their job. Sorry. 
Or, do you mean that they weren't able to view his cell? And I mean, they said that the dimensions of Rick's cell were larger than what the factual dimensions of the cell were. So I don't know my thoughts about them trying to measure Rick's cell. It's like, this is a prison and it's been there for a while. They have like a standard size for the cell. I know he's in solitary confinement by himself, but I mean, I don't know what would happen based on the defense team actually going into his jail cell. I don't know how many lawyers in general are allowed to just walk into the jail in the area where like it's solitary confinement. I don't know that Westville is like punishing just Rick's lawyers. Hi, Morgan. I love that you're catching this live too. I don't know if I rule or not, but wish you were way more active on YouTube. See you in two months when, <laughs> so yeah, my next live chat will probably be Rick was uh, first taken into custody October 26th and his arrest was announced October 28th. Somebody named Oscar said my live chats are always when he's sleeping. I guess he's in Europe. So I will do two live chats at the end of October. I will try to cover as many time zones around the world as I can. And I might as well ask you guys now, it's so boring with me just on the camera, on camera by myself, who would you guys want to be a guest for those October live chats where we kind of do a year in review since Rick was arrested? No comment. Living vicariously HD, I'll get to your comment in a later section about that topic. Hi, Ray. Rick is going to have problems no matter where he goes, as he should. Yeah, I know a lot of people are concerned that Rick is in Westville, but I, I really just don't think that Indiana and Carroll County is trying to punish Rick because they can't keep him in Carroll County Jail. I know that the Cass County Jail warden said we can have him, but we don't really want him because they would have issues transporting him to jail and, or sorry, to the court dates. So it seems like Westville has 24 seven medical and mental health. These county jails do not, they have these uh, people coming in once a week for medical and mental issues or help. And I, I know a lot of people think there's like major corruption and it's a conspiracy theory with like from Doug Carter down, but I mean, I, I just don't agree with that. I mean, these people, it said that Rick has been after his early April confessions. I know some people don't think it's a confession, but we'll find out. I don't know. After his supposed April confessions, it said that he was evaluated, I think by two psychiatrists and one psychologist. So, I mean, I just don't think like these mental health professionals who have spent years getting their certifications are going to have slick Nick Mick, the prosecutor be like, Hey, lie and say that Rick is mentally fine. I, I just don't think that these professionals are going to like go along with that. So if these three professionals said that Rick is okay mentally, then I, I believe that. I don't think they're part of some boost or boost modal. I don't think they're part of some massive conspiracy. Hi, Boost Mobile. I was so happy to see you. It ruined my train of thought. Thank you, Boost Mobile. Mobile. I hope you're okay in NC. Oh, what was this? Hold on. Hi, I like turtles. See you at the next member live chat every Saturday or the third Saturday Saturday of every month. What do we got here? I'll highlight a few more things before I go to my next PowerPoint slide, which let me look and see what I'm talking about next. Oh, Kegokio. <laughs> okay. Fig solves that inmate Robert Baston has a colorful criminal record to say the least. I know he, he's a a-hole, sorry. <laughs> that doesn't mean that he's not telling the truth about what's going on. Uh, in Westville, in the solitary confinement area, in the solitary confinement wing. Sorry, I'm trying to read comments to see 
what I'm going to highlight next. I'm sweating, sorry. <laughs> Susie doesn't know how to feel about it all. It's also confusing. I know there's a lot of confusing parts of this case. Meerkat says he is much safer at Westville than in a county jail. There's nothing wrong with where he's currently being held. Judge Gull saw, saw right through the BS by the defense. I agree. I think it was BS by the defense, which I showed in a previous live chat that at least six of their allegations were totally exaggerated. Not that I saw a freak. Babu's Frick is a Star Wars character. And this is actually George Lucas who created Star Wars. This is his online profile. He's a really big fan of mine. <laughs> where's Michael McDonald from the Doobie Brothers? And where's Mal Malgorjada? I gave her a shout out. She's sleeping. A lot of people say they watch my live chats to hear my boring vo voice put them to sleep. So good night, everybody. Hi, Holly and hell. <laughs> Hi, Ivy. I don't, but I do them because some people say they find them helpful. Hi, Judy. Nice to see you. I would have never thought that the person we all knew as BG would turn out to be only five foot three, according to his driver's license. I think it was five foot four was a certain legal document that came out. Some people say... Well, if that was his driver's license when he was 16 years old or whatever, maybe he grew an inch or two in the whatever, almost 30 years since. There's been a lot of like debate about how tall Rick is. I have to go with this guy. I think his name is Steve on YouTube because I made a community post a few months ago saying, does anybody live near Delphi? Because can you go to the courthouse in Carroll County? and bring a tape measure and go to the corner entrance where Rick has been entering the court for his hearings and measure up to this one point where it seems like the top of Rick head, Rick's head is. And some people said that this guy named Steve had already done some videos. I think he estimated that it came up to about five foot three or five foot four. I know it's, that seems to be accurate to me because I've looked at the pictures of Rick walking in to the jail and the video and it seems to be accurate. So I don't know. We'll find out maybe someday. Oh my God. My, my fiance is here. Hi, wife Lilith. Since Kagan has gone so long, I asked wife Lilith to marry me. So we're engaged. No, I'm kidding. I have nothing against any YouTube creator, anybody on Reddit. I do my thing. People do theirs. I have no drama. I haven't even read what you have to say. Maybe I should do that first. Rick refuses to what Rick refuses to anyone talk to Rick refuses to talk to anyone since he told his wife on the phone in April, he doesn't even log in on his tablet anymore. Hi, wife Lilith. So let me just bring this up. Wife Lilith, I have nothing against you, but she posted on her community wall on YouTube. Is she blushing right now? She was talking about people have been who chirped Kagan, which is texting somebody in prison or jail. And then she said, quote, even Tom Webster chirped him with three exclamation points. I was like, I have never chirped or texted Kagan. I will get to something in a second, but I just never did that. And she did retract that. So I don't know if somebody was pretending to be the iconic Tom Webster. Wife Lilith, if you have reports of who the phone numbers of people who contacted Kagan. Can you tell me the phone number of somebody who was pretending to be me? So Sleuth or Vandross can investigate. Kagan, I finally, so I have never texted him. As I've said before, I have so I have like 10 pages of qu questions for Kagan. A lot of people still seem to think that Kagan and or his dad was involved with Delphi. He's done interviews with a few people. And frankly, I just have so many more questions that I cannot move on with my life until I ask him these questions. I know some of you are saying, Tom, you're the one who gave him the nickname Kegokio because he lies more than Pinocchio. How can you expect to ask him questions and have him tell the truth? I don't know. So I finally 
signed up on Monday, I think, for like the communication system for talking to prisoners in Indiana. And it had an option where you can say who you want to talk to. And I found Kegan. I have not seen any kind of notification before that he like accepted it or whatever. It was just, I did not try to schedule anything. I just like added him as the person who I was looking to talk to. I don't know. He was in like a, I don't want to say a halfway house. It's called the Reception Diagnostics Center or something. So after people are convicted, apparently in Indiana, they go to this place to get evaluated mentally and physically. I don't know who's checking out Kegan's body. Anyway, um, so then the next day, I th I don't know if he knows who I am. Wife Lilith, do you know? Hopefully he doesn't know that I call him Kegokia. Uh, so I wrote a one page letter and I put it in the mail on Tuesday and I sent it to Reception Diagnostic Center. And then the next day, I guess yesterday, it was announced that Kagan got moved to Wabash Correctional Facility. So hopefully they'll forward my letter to him. And I don't know if he's going to write back, but I'll keep you posted. So I'm looking to do an interview with Kagan that's going to last like 25 hours because I have so many questions, but who knows what's going to happen. So we'll, we'll see. Don't be mad at me. I know some people are like, don't pay attention to him. He's horrible, but I just need to ask him a lot of questions. Nick Johns, before, when I saw your first comment on my live chat, I thought I said Nick Jonas. So I had to like squint. I think I need to upgrade my contacts prescription. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for joining. Hi, Susie Q. Oh, hi, Illegally Blonde. I haven't seen you in two months. <laughs> Rick is fine. No special treatment for him. No comment. Roman Castavet. Tom's appearances are quality, not quantity. I don't know about that. It's all downhill from the start. I'm not looking to see how many people are watching. How long have I been doing this? 45 minutes? All right, I'll get back to my iconic PowerPoints in a second. We're, we're, we're going to talk about Kagan more. Hi, gangster computer god. Can this be multiple choice? I'm so far behind that I forgot. Yeah, I'm 10 minutes behind on chat, on comments. <laughs> Hi, Gen X Rando, Doug Carter. You're Doug Carter. Do you have a poem for us? Oh my gosh. I, oh, yes. Oh, okay. This this 10 minutes ago, I asked who you guys wanted to have on these October live chat. So Doug Carter is not going to show up on this embarrassing my YouTube channel. Um Marshall, hi Marshall. Marshall wants Kagan. I don't think he can do a live chat. We'll see. Uh, who? So who else do you guys want to see on my live chats? Uh, for October. Grizzly True Crime. I think she doesn't know who I am. Although Preci, oh my gosh, Preci. Anyway, no comment. Aspen Connor as guest host. He can come on if he wants. Just you? No, I'm so it's so boring. Just me. Fig solves. Yeah, he, he can come on. Sorry, I'm just trying to see who you guys want to see. Whoops. I'm trying. Oh, geez, I went way too far down. Somebody said, uh, Deb, Deb, if you want to come on, you can in October, not in September or August. Oh my gosh. Sorry, let me just do a few more comments and then I will go back to my whatever my PowerPoints. The murder sheet. If they want to come on, they can. I hope Gray was oh my God, don't even get me started. No, I'm not into drama, but I went into it. Oh, no, I'm gonna even say. <laughs> Actually, Gray Hughes does a live chat every night. So you guys should go there right now and lower the amount of people watching me right now, which I'm not looking at. As I take a deep breath. This is a good point. Meerkat. And it's not like the defense didn't already know the actual size of the cell before making those false claims. Rick isn't their first client, lol. Well, it could be their first client in Westville and Solitaire. We, we don't know that, so don't spread false information, Meerkat. 
Nick from True Crime Garage. I don't really like True Crime, so I know that True Crime Garage is a very popular podcast, but I doubt they know who I am. I'm a very minor YouTube person. Four pit bulls across America. Yeah, bring Doug Carter on. Step up, Doug. Dougie Fresh. Um, <laughs> Dougie Fresh is a rapper in the 80s. He, I mean, he's a really nice person, but there are so many things that went wrong with the Delphi investigation that caused millions of dollars to have to be spent. So, I mean, they don't have to tell me, but as a Indiana citizen, people really need to demand that like their process needs to be updated. I know that it was totally, I don't want to say cluster, but they were totally overwhelmed when this first happened. I've said previously that there's been some, there were early on, there were TV news reports where it said there were 200 officers from either 20 different agencies or 45 different agencies. And so it was very confusing. So I'm trying to be polite and realizing I'm not acting like, oh, if I was involved, like we would have found Rick's tip immediately, but I don't know. There definitely needs to be some accountability and an invest investigation into this investigation. And also Kagan, they found his CSAM on his devices, February 25th, 2017. He was not charged for three and a half years. Like that was a total mess up transferring it from Carroll County to Miami County. Yeah. Hold on. Sorry. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Hi, Martha. I've not been to Winnipeg, but th actually this area here, I highly recommend Vancouver, Canada. I'm running away to Vancouver. Hi, or no, I have to say, yo, Hannes, keep the format the way it is. It works. It gets the information across. It's not the Tonight Show, <laughs> the Tom H Show. No, it would be nice to have some other people instead of me just rambling for three hours. Oh my gosh, I'm not highlighting that one. They do illegally. I don't know what that's talking about. I'm not highlighting mean comments about other creators because I'm not causing drama. I don't know. Let me just say this. Hi, K Money, talking about people making money. Gray has made so much money off of Delphi. I promise I'll go back to the case in like one minute. I don't know that this is true because if you uh, donate to YouTube, they take out 30%. And then for taxes, you have to take about 30%. And he says that he then gives to charity half of it. So I think if you're thinking that these YouTube creators make a ton of money off of these videos for true crime, I'm sorry, but it's just wrong. My first Delphi video, which is two and a half hours long, or no, two hours and 11 minutes. I checked, like, I don't even care what the stats are, but I checked a few months ago and it's two hours and 11 minutes long. How much money do you think I made from that? Because I think like the first 50,000 views, I did not monetize it. But then people asked me to share my file. So I had to make a website, which has cost me over $300. So a few months ago, it said that first video has 154,000 views. It's two hours long. YouTube said that I made $305 off of it which I then have to pay taxes on. So, I mean, if you think like it's a ton of money in YouTube, it, it's not, and that's not my motivation. So that's a fun fact. Wait, I have some start here. Speaking of not making money, sorry, but I have to acknowledge these people. Gizmo, I don't like to repeat com uh, compliments. You're the best and love your sense of humor. Thank you. I used to know some people who had a cat named Gizmo. Hi to everybody who uses their cat as their avatar. <laughs> Where's Shelly? Shelly Miskovich from um, Scientology. This is, um, it's not Erica. It's Leah Remini from Camp Queens. Hey, any update on Missy's case coming? Unfortunately, no. Missy Beavers is the other case that I spent like over 600 hours and eight months looking into. I did a four hour and 51 minute video on her case. And unfortunately, Shelly, Erica, Leah, there's no updates in Missy's case. All right. Let me get back to Kagan and ignore all of you. I'm sweating. Yeah, get me off the screen. 
I am going to share some PowerPoint slides. Yay, PowerPoint. I'll get to Excel later for people who get turned on by Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> Wait, I have to take this off. Thank you, Shelly, or Erica, sorry. I'm going to review some Kagan updates because I have not done a live chat since Homeboy was sentenced July 27th. So let me drink, drink time. Fifty minutes in, two hours and ten more minutes. Kagan was sentenced to forty years plus three years probation. He is already, I think, he's already appealing the length but not, he will not be able to change his guilty plea. Since he said he was guilty, he can't change that, but he can appeal. That was the first burp of the night, sorry. Um, he is appealing the length. From what I saw online, I think in, in, in Indiana, sorry, in Indiana, for every three days that you serve without causing problems in prison, they give you one day of like time served or like good time. So they will remove one day from your total sentence for every three days you're a good boy. So I believe that brings his sentence down to 30 years. And which so this person be below, Courtney Alwine, murder sheet, and for, interviewed her. She's the Miami County prosecutor for his CSAM case. And she said for people who are in jail or sorry, prison, if they try and like study some stuff and maybe get a GED for like a high school diploma or a college degree, the most that they can get off their sentence in addition is up to two years. So at this point, I believe the shortest time Kagan can serve is 28 years. Two quick updates I've seen in the news in the past week. I think I saw a story. It was India in Indiana and this guy, this horrible person, which you'll find out in a second, he was cooking something, maybe popcorn at home, and it caught on fire. So he called the fire department. And when they were there and the police, they saw these, I think, binders in his um, house that he had all of these pictures of CSAM. It said he had over 1 million photos of CSAM, which is like molesting children for people who don't know. He just got sentenced, I believe, to 15 years. So, I mean, I can see how Kagan can kind of be upset that he got such a long sentence. And another one, which was not in Indiana, I think this person, this guy got caught with 600 images and he got, I think, 10 years. So I can see why Kagan is upset. Christine Reed. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for your Venmo donation. I really appreciate it. I'll buy some Taco Bell. <laughs> I need a new Taco Bell cup. All right, what am I doing here? All right, I need to focus like Rick's 2016 Ford. So I summarized the murder sheet interview. I know everybody loves murder sheet. It's murder sheet, not murder sheets. They only have one spreadsheet, unlike me. Kidding. So they interviewed after the trial was, um, after Rick, or Rick Kagan was sentenced, they interviewed her. She said... These are some of the low lights, I guess. I don't want to say highlights. There were several examples uh, were presented at, I guess, this final hearing of how Kagan used the profile, sorry, used a fake profile pretending to be a teenage girl, which was the Emily Ann profile, just to try and get other young girls to send him photos and videos. He was very manipulative in order to get sympathy and see Sam. Originally, I had written this one instance where I, it was kind of too graphic and I don't want to upset people watching, but there was this girl who her mother was in a hospital and Kagan as this fake teenage girl, Emily Ann had this girl who was visiting her mom in the hospital. He said, go into the bathroom in the hospital and take some photos and videos of her, which she did. And he also sent her a, I think a video of a two to three year old being abused. And so I can see how people hate Kagan and think he should he should be in jail as long as possible. So one other thing was in one media interview that Kagan did, he blamed his dad 
for the CSAM images on his phones of the very young children. So he kind of admitted that he was responsible for like the 12 to whatever, 16 year olds, but he is still denying that he was the one who got this very, these very young media images. However, the prosecutor said, we have access to all of Kagan's talks and chats that he's doing with people. And so in one other interview that Kagan did, he blamed it on his friend from Las Vegas and not his dad. So I know a lot of people still think Kagan and his dad might be involved, but it seems like the prosecutor does not think anybody else was involved or using the Anthony Shaw's profile. I know quite a few people think that maybe Kagan was uh, sharing or selling access to Anthony Schott's social media profiles. I've said this previously, it seems like police found out exactly who Kagan was because they knew about the Anthony Schott's either Instagram or Snapchat profile. So they contacted Instagram and Snapchat who said it's a Comcast IP address. So they contacted Comcast who said that Comcast IP address belongs to whatever, the address where Kagan and his father lived. We have not seen any evidence that that report of who is accessing um, the Anthony Shots profiles was whatever. Some people thought he was selling access to Rick, but wouldn't Rick's home IP address or his phone IP address have shown up in that initial report, which it, is, it does not seem like it did. So moving along, prosecutors said chats were happening for hours and days at a time and could not have been anyone other than Kagan, and quote, he, Kagan, did it all day, every day for years. The exact same verbiage that he was using with these girls is what he was using in the jail chirps and texts and phone calls that he was using once he was talking in uh, Miami County Jail, and he started talking to various women. He was pretty much using them and lying to them just to get money for Doritos. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and for more chats, like, I don't know, you have to get money on commissary to do chats. She continued the exact same tone. I don't like to say certain words. So the exact same acts and descriptions, the same phrases. I mean, this is clearly the same person and quote. So the prosecutor has seen a lot more stuff than we have. She does not think anybody else was accessing Anthony shots other than Kagan. The final uh, paragraph here. Regarding the 2020 Kagan police interview, when a detective stated that two people were using different tone verbiage in the Anthony Schatz messages, she said Kagan was saying a lot of weird stuff. The, that prosecutor, Courtney, thinks it was one of the tools Kagan used. He crafted the fake dad and another Adam character, which were social media profiles, using photos he found online, just like he did. Um, yeah, it's the exact same thing he did as Anthony Schatz. There was other one other thing that came up, I believe, in Kagan's interview with the murder sheet that I did not type up here that I think you guys would be interested in. Don't quote me on this because I'm not exactly, I don't remember it exactly, but I think they asked him about the Wabash search. And if you remember about a year ago, there was some secret court filing where they took him out of Miami County Jail and apparently to Grissom Air Force Base for some kind of like interview. And then it was like that day or the next day, they started the approximately five week Wabash River search. Sorry, I'm catching up on burps. <laughs> so embarrassing. Okay, keep, keep it moving, Tom. Um, he really did not give an answer to the murder sheet about if he was responsible for the police looking in the Wabash River for five weeks. I believe what he told them was something along the lines of, he said that Slick Nick Mick, which is a nickname for prosecutor Slick, or sorry, not Slick, Nick McClelland. <laughs> um, he said that Nick McClelland was at this Grissom Air Force Base interview. And in a previous interview, he said that Nick said he could not corroborate or corroborate Kagan's claims, although Kagan never really said what his claims were related to Delphi. So Kagan seemed to insinuate in his last murder sheet interview that possibly the reason that police spent five weeks looking in the Wabash River Bridge, which is very close to Kagan's dad's house, was maybe because Kagan said something along the lines of, 
the, along the lines of, well, maybe the murderer threw a weapon or something over the bridge. I don't know if he specifically said the um, Wabash River or that bridge that goes right by Kagan's house, which was searched for five weeks. I don't know. It, it, it was not a very clear answer. So there's still real no confirmation exactly what that what prompted that five week Wabash River search or if they found anything. There have been rumors that they spent so much time searching in this river. I know it was a very hot topic last summer, exactly a year ago. And people were wondering, well, at that time, a lot of people thought were Kagan and his dad involved. And as they were coming back from Delphi, did they throw a burner phone in the bridge? Did they throw a gun? Did they throw the murder knife or what? So the rumor or speculation was that after a few weeks of not finding anything really relevant to the Delphi murders, that Doug Carter said, I want the investigators to go back to the very beginning and start reviewing tips, which I'm going to just go back here. I have something to share. Please hold a moment. Let me just find this. All right, stop and present. This is from the PCA. I'm kind of rambling, which is my on brand for me. Oh my gosh. So it said that the rumor was that nothing was turned up in this five week Wabash River search. Doug Carter says, I want you to go back to the beginning. So this is from the PCA. I'll just read this top part here. Sorry, what am I doing? Um, this had the last name of Witness 4, so I just kind of tried to change it to Witness 4, since I think more people know who Witness 4 is other than that person's name. And I, I try to give these people privacy because they obviously did not ask for this. Okay, so Witness 4 parked at Mears intersection at 146 actual time, or no, sorry, they were her car was captured on the Hoosier Harvest Store camera, which is like 20 seconds from the Mears parking lot. Witness four saw the girls walking above as she went under the railroad bridge, which is to the left or west of um, the Freedom Bridge. So why am I bringing this up? The Wabash River search started around August 18th or 19th. This says, and I think we were, we thought it was like five weeks total. So this is about four weeks after. It says on September 21st, 2022, Carroll County Detective Tony Liggett was provided was provided a tip narrative from the FBI like tip organization system to try and make all these tips easier to follow, which we know what happened there. And why did that happen? We need somebody needs to figure that out. So what was provided a tip narrative from um, Orion is the name of this FBI, FBI system. DIN, I don't know what D stands for, but I imagine the IN stands for identification number. C, 00074-01 to review. My speculation is that once they come up, come up with a case, they add these tips and give it a number in chronological order. So to me, it seems like Rick's interview was the 74th tip entered into the Orion system. And I'm rambling. I forgot what I was talking about. Um, so it was from the conservation officer, and then you know that. So I forget what I was talking about. Help me. <laughs> what was, oh, I was talking about Kagan, the Wabash River search. Yeah, I don't know. I'm rambling. Let me go to your comments. Let's see. Um, let me go down to what you guys are talking about now. I, I, I sorry, I'm all over the place. Cut me some slack. I will go to my next PowerPoint slide in a second, but I don't want to ignore you guys in your comments. Does anybody remember what I was talking about? <laughs> yeah, all right. Hi, Emily Ann, Heaven's Angel. Yes, and Doug's Chopper, yes, I remember this, went down there that day. And another YouTuber who was in jail 
suddenly got re-arrested on a Carroll County hold, was moved to Cass the same day, apparently for overcrowding. I kind of forget exactly who you're talking about. You can say other um, channel, other YouTube people's names. I, I really don't care. Like some people don't like to allow people to talk about other YouTube creators. I, I mean, I prefer that you don't diss them, but if you want to recommend channels to other people, it's fine. If you know anybody who has insomnia issues, AK19 says, oh my God, it's my favorite channel, Tom, to fall asleep to and then rewatch for the info later. All right, good night, sweet dreams. Dave says, in my opinion, there was a pause in the Wabash River search. It was then that they found the tip. Yeah, I don't I don't know, Dave. I, I, I think they continued to search Wabash after the September 21st, which it seems interesting that they said was uh Liggett was provided a tip. So from who? And actually, yeah, let's talk about my favorite person, Shankmeister. Where's Billy Wolf? Um, Billy Wolf is a subscriber who gives these people nicknames, but I think I gave her Shankmeister. So Shank is the last name of the lady who's the receptionist at Carroll County uh, Sheriff's Office. And if you remember in late October, 2022, I think it was on October 31st, on stage when they finally announced this press conference, more information about Rick, there was one woman who was the only non-law enforcement officer on stage. And Doug Carter said for Kathy Shank, something like, thank you or for your dedication to detail. So did she, Shankmeister, go into the Orion system and go starting with tip C000, whatever, four zeros, and then zero, zero. And then she came along to tip number 74, which I believe the dash one is Rick's first interview. And maybe in October, 2022, they just added like a dash two to kind of like add more information to the initial person, Rick Allen. So I don't know. What am I talking about here? Oh, I actually want to, I probably shouldn't share this. Hold, hold on. Let's see. Somebody recently shared this that I thought was kind of interesting. Please hold a moment. I remember, I don't, this is from early on, I think. Yeah, I don't have where this, which date, uh, maybe, oh, no, so it says one month. Monday marks one month since two young girls were murdered in a wooded area in Carroll County as dozens of state, local, and federal investigators slog through a mountain of tips that figuratively stretches from central Indiana to FBI offices in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter told Fox 59 News that he, think, that he thinks the clue to solve the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German is not yet among the more than 13,000 tips that an FBI database sifts, sifts through around the clock in order to give Delphi investigators a solid lead in the hunt for their suspect. I'll just finish this last paragraph. Quote, to say we've identified a single individual would not be accurate, but we have identified several people of interest, which honestly, I don't think it was Rick Allen at that, at that time, said Carter, who admitted investigators need to seal off several blind alleys before narrowing their focus in the search for the man in the images and audio Libby captured on her cell phone minutes before she was led to her death. So as I was saying before, there needs to be some kind of internal investigation or external, like some somebody needs to figure out where they went wrong with this investigation because it, it costs not just so much money, but these poor families have had to spend like five and a half years wondering what happened when it should have been solved in the first week. I mean, I hate to criticize law enforcement, but sometimes you have to like call people out to make a positive change. One more thing kind of related to this issue. Jerry Holman, hopefully he's not watching and upset that I'm bringing up this comment. No, Nobody watches me who is internal to this case. So what, what's in here? So this is from an interview with Jerry Holman, but we have now, 
sorry, but we have now, so I mean, we continue to do that. And now six months later, after it happened, we're still getting new tips on people. So we're following up on those, but we also have a group of detectives that are assigned to go back and make sure that we did not miss anything, review things. And so we're taking it very serious and we're not interruption in quotes. You know, I think a big, your biggest fear when you're doing an investigation is something might slip through the cracks and we're not going to let that happen. We got a team of people that keep going back and reviewing and we're getting there. Like I said, we're working harder than ever and we're con going to continue to work hard. So I just don't know. Some people have talked about, could this tip for Rick have been marked that he was a witness and not a suspect? So did they ignore this tip number 74 every time it came up or do they have some kind of system where they would only see people who have not been cleared and maybe Rick had somehow been cleared just along the same topic. The, some people have found the, I think it was from, I don't know for sure if it was the 2000, one of the 2017 press conferences where a lot of law enforcement were on the stage or the April, 2019 one. But people have found photos where they think that this con conservation officer who gave Rick this interview, apparently outside of a grocery store, like the day after or two days after the murders, he was on stage at these press conferences. So people are wondering, how did that conservation officer not like remember Rick telling him, yeah, I was there for two hours from 1.30 to 3.30? I don't know. So what I was thinking, trying to like make sense of that, it's been speculated that maybe Rick talked to the conservation officer before the February 15th in the afternoon, I think, or late afternoon, maybe, is when they released the screenshot from Libby's video and the audio. So I was thinking that there's quite a few photos of Rick wearing like a black winter jacket that has like a small like white stripe somewhere. And I looked online and February 15th, the low temperature at 9 a.m. was 26 degrees. So when Rick met this conservation officer before the blue jacket image was re released, was Rick wearing his black jacket? So the conservation officer, I mean, Rick told him, I saw these juveniles early on, but for the next two hours, I didn't see anybody. I roll. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that later in like the seventh hour. So, I mean, I could kind of see as possibly a way that um, this conservation officer really didn't think back to Rick as a suspect is if he was wearing like a black jacket when he talked to the conservation officer. And also if he did not have his hood on and he had a very, he's always had a very short haircut, but in the screenshot of Bridge Guy, you cannot see that he has a very short haircut and you really can't see much on his face. So. Those are my thoughts on a variety of things. So let me see what you guys are talking about. Let me pretend like I care. I'm kidding. Somebody named Aspen Connor. And now that Rick is accused, he's also the most important witness because his statements will be telling during the trial. What can I say about Rick's statements? I, I just can't get past this. Yes, I, I want to talk about this. How many people are watching? Oh, it's only 300 people. All right, that's good. I can deal with that compared to 600 people. All right, I'm at the one hour, 15 minute mark. Rick says he went from Freedom Bridge to platform one on the bridge. And then he went to a bench and that he never saw Abby and Libby. And I'm sure you guys have hopefully seen, I mean, I in my, my video about evidence against Rick and also my... Uh, which one was it? I think my unsealed documents video. I showed like the Google Maps and the timestamps of when people were on the trail. So I showed that witness four, I believe she went to, um, she saw, hold on, let me show this real quick. Or right, one moment, please. Can I do this? No, I can't. Give me one second. I'm going to try something now. Oh, right, yeah, here we go. Uh, let's see. All right. How's that? Give me a second. 
All right. So this is what the trail looked like in 2017, I believe. Sorry. So witness for it. Um, platform one, you cannot see until you're close up. So witness four said she was there exercising, which where, oh, I can't do that. Sorry. I can't use my cursor to show. All right. I got it right for one time. So platform one, it's like over here where Rick said he was standing. According to my expert calculations, witness four is seen on Hoosier Harvester camera at 146. She parks at Mears parking lot within one minute. It takes a minute to walk to the Mears intersection. I believe she made a left on the 501 trail. From my watching various YouTube videos, it takes about five and a half minutes to six minutes from Mears intersection to the start of the bridge. So let's say six minutes, we'll get to the halfway point in a second. So I imagine she like walked on this trail. And I think my estimates are around 153. She kind of peeks her head around this gate and sees a guy, which Rick said he was on platform one. So 153, I would imagine if she's out there exercising on a normal basis, she's not going to be like skipping along the bridge. I mean, I would imagine she has some kind of routine where Maybe she always, I, I'm speculating, not saying for sure. Don't want to trigger anybody. Um, what am I talking about? So I would imagine she parks at mirrors, looks at the bridge. If nobody's there, she'll maybe spend more time looking at the fishies down below. I'll get to that in a second with the picture. So she sees Rick and I'm sure she's like, I'm turning around now. I don't want to be stuck around here like with some guy. So she turns around. I don't know how long she was there. But Rick, Rick never said that he saw her. So I have no clue. I mean, I'm assuming, which I've been wanting to say this for a while. I assume, which probably isn't a good idea because at one of my previous jobs, my CEO, I said, I probably, I rarely mess up um, at work. And <laughs> I'm so embarrassing. What am I talking about? So I must have messed up. And I said to my CEO, which I was sitting down at my desk and he was standing. And I said, oh, I assumed. And he said, Tom, you know what happens when you assume? It makes an ass out of you and me because assume is spelled A-S-S-U-M-E. And so he was standing and I was sitting and my reaction was like, and then he turned around and I was like, I wrong. So whenever I say the word assume, I kind of remember that you should not assume. So my guess is i forgot what i was even assuming so she turns around and if it's a six minute walk from mirrors to um the start of the bridge my estimates are that she said that she passes abby and libby on this trail which is a small trail about halfway between mirrors lot and excuse me sorry Mirrors lot and the bridge. So at that point, Rick is on platform. Well, we don't know as soon as she turns around. Sorry. We don't know what Rick did. So let me try and focus um, on one thing at a time. So Abby and Libby are approximately two and a half to three minutes from getting to this point of the bridge. While Rick, I mean, where else is Rick going to go? This is my biggest question, or one of them. How does Rick get from there to a bench? The, the first bench, there's five benches on this trail. The fifth one and closest to the bridge is at the Mears intersection. So how does Homeboy get from the bridge to a bench without passing Abby and Libby on this very small trail? Nobody has been able to give me a logical scenario in 10 months since Rick has been arrested. I'm totally open-minded. Please, somebody. I know it's difficult to write these comments because you can only fit a certain number of characters, but for people who are watching the replay in the comments below, please, somebody, is there any logical way that Rick does not see Abby and Libby um, does not see Abby and Libby. So speaking of that, for my Excel spreadsheet fans, I do have, 
I started with a um, a spreadsheet tracker for my theories because I have so many different ideas. So spreadsheet time. <laughs> How much more time? I don't know. Hopefully people are finding this somewhat interesting. So that's way too close. Okay, so I have all these different tabs on the bottom. Please hold while I try and make this easy for all of you to read. So this is my little tracker here. Can you see that? You guys, I think you should. So I'm going to be looking at that. I'm not looking at your comments, but so give me like a few minutes to talk about this. So I try to organize my thoughts. And as you guys have seen previously, I try and have an open mind. I'm not out against like Rick to try and convict him. I try and make sense of all these various different things. So I try and come up with lists, reasons for and reasons against. I do it for the various suspects and these various potential scenarios. So let me see if I can get through this. Let me drink my drink. Everybody drink. I just spilled. Luckily, I'm not on camera. It's on my desk, not on my shirt, as usual in the past. All right. Witness four in the top right up here. Witness four saw Rick around 153 on platform one, which he admitted standing on. She turns around and passes Abby and Libby when they are less than three minutes from Monon High Bridge. It seems impossible for Rick to have not seen Abby and Libby. Can anyone, especially Rick, explain how it is possible for Rick? I'm oh, sorry. How it is possible that Rick says he went from platform one to a bench on the trail and didn't see Abby and Libby or anyone. I'm going to look at your comments right now to see if anybody. Because I am Verona tragedy and you're a loser who somebody needs to boot because I've seen your horrible comments before. I don't know why you show up. So somebody can kick that person's ass out of here. Thank you. Hi, Lynn. Could Rick have been on the bench when Libby and Abby went by? No, I don't think so. It's just not possible that um, witness four sees Rick on the bridge and then she sees she's in between Rick and Abby, Lib Abby and Libby on the small trail. It, it just seems impossible. Four pit bulls, they were dropped off at the lane by the bridge, Mir's parking lot. So no, he wouldn't have seen them necessarily. How? I mean, I, I've showed this picture before, like the aerial view is, is just impossible, in my opinion, to see or to figure out how Rick goes from the platform on the bridge to a bench without passing them. Fig Solves finds this somewhat interesting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Dave, the only way he could not have seen them, in my opinion, is if he crossed the bridge, which I've shown in my previous videos that if you zoom in on Libby's photo of the entire bridge, if you zoom in, it seems like there could be a potential like human figure at the very end of the bridge, which could be Rick if he went off platform one and then went to the south end to see if he was there like with plans to do something horrible. He needed to check to see if he was going to try and kidnap or whatever or force somebody down the end of the bridge. He wanted to see exactly who was down there um, at that end of the bridge. So also, I think a lot of people, I don't know what people are thinking, but if you see the Libby's video with a bridge guy walking from the north end of the bridge, I don't know if people think that was their first interaction with Rick, but it seems to me like there had to have been some kind of prior interaction if Rick got off platform one and started walking on the trails, did he pass them on the trails? Did he pass? Was he on platform one when they arrived? And then he saw them and got off platform one to let them start walking down. And then maybe he hid behind the gate that you can see. I mean, actually, I'm not on camera right now. But what I was just showing, did he hide behind the gate as they went along? And then at some point he came out or was he at the south end and they somehow passed closely there? And then when he turns around in the middle of the bridge is when Libby got scared and started filming. So to me, it seems like almost impossible that Rick does not see Abby and Libby. Almost impossible that he did not have some kind of very close 
interaction with them before we see bridge guy walking in their direction. Hi, JW. Well, of course, Rick waddled his way to the bench. Um, sorry, I'm just looking for comments here. I'm looking to see any kind of reason or scenario you guys think how Rick does not see Abby and Libby. Hi, Diana. Nice to see you. Sit back and relax. We'll be here for another hour and a half, maybe. Uh, let's see. Dave says, and from the first image Libby took, there is nobody on the bridge. I, I think there could be at the very end, Dave. I'm not sure, but I do think it's a possibility that Rick went from platform one to the south end. I mean, it, it just seems impossible for me to figure out a way that he does not see them. Meerkat says there's no way he didn't see them. Uh, let's see. Let me just get back to this um, iconic spreadsheet. <laughs> so I do try to think of ways that it is possible. So excluding Abby and Libby, I do believe it could have been possible that Rick, if he sat on bench one, which is the one nearest to Freedom Bridge, while all these other people that we know of, like flannel shirt guy and his brother, arguing couple, Libby's dad, and the two adult females, it seems like they all parked at mirrors. And we don't really have any definite um, confirmation that any of them did walk past the mirrors intersection in the area of Freedom Bridge. We do not. Oh, so let me go over here on the right. So reasons against, we don't know if others who we don't know about, like other witnesses, walked from Freedom Bridge to the Mirrors intersection and passed all five benches between the times of 2.13 and 3.25, giving Rick like five minutes to go back to his car since he sa said he left around 3.30. For any of these other people to say, yes, I walked from Freedom Bridge to Mirrors during 2.13 to 3.25 and I did not see Rick Allen or anybody matching him on one of the benches. A few more things here. Reasons for, we don't know for sure where witness four went after she saw Rick on platform one, but it seems as though she was exercising and may have walked in a decent, or sorry, a decent distance in the direction of Freedom Bridge before turning her car around. I could be wrong. Against that, if witness four walked near Freedom Bridge and back, it seems like the timing seems somewhat possible if she, her car was captured leaving at 2.14. Abby and Libby were at the bridge by two o'clock. So if Rick some, oh, I messed up. So if Rick somehow got off platform one and back on the trail headed to a bench, he would have seen witness four between two and two ten when she was still, um, if she went in the direction of Freedom Bridge and then walked back to Mirror. So she, I mean, Rick never said that he saw this woman. Um, two more things here. The witness four timeline, from what I can tell, 146, her car is seen on the Hoosier Harvester camera. Around 153, she sees Rick on platform one. Approximately 155 to 156, she passes Abby and Libby. Around 159, she passes the Mears intersection. Based on her car leaving around 213, I kind of assumed that, I shouldn't assume, um, for approximately six minutes, she walked um, down the trail near Freedom Bridge and turns around. I don't know that she could walk that entire time or that entire distance exactly to Freedom Bridge and Bench One within six minutes. So another six minutes back, one minute it takes from the Mears intersection to her car, about one minute in her car, and then she is captured at 2.14 leaving. For this, I said Witness 4 could have gone down the 505 trail to the water. So how could Rick have not seen Witness 4 and how could she have not seen him on the trail? So this possible scenario that I thought of. Witness 4 could have gone to the Mears intersection and then walked down the 505 trail, which for people who don't know, 505 means it takes 505 steps from the Mears intersection down to the water. It takes 501 steps from the Mears intersection to the high bridge. So Witness 4 could have gone down the 505 to the water and not seen Rick 
and then he passed Mir's intersection by the time she had returned. So that could be possible, but the prosecution will reveal which bench Rick said he sat on for 90 minutes without anyone passing and without his butt getting sore enough that he had to get up. So Rick said he went from platform one to a bench and he left at 3.30. So it seems to me like he had to have been sitting on a bench for 90 minutes on this trail that takes about 15 minutes each way to walk. So I don't know. It's just like, why is this guy hanging out on a bench for 90 minutes? And he said he did not see anybody. These are things that make you go, hmm, or at least make me go, hmm. <laughs> Emily Ann, Heaven's Angels. Wait, what about the dog walking lady who says she talked to bridge guy? Does someone make that up? I, I don't know. I, I've heard various rumors about this. I think that was around, was that around 1230? And was she, I, I don't know, Emily Ann. I, I just don't, I can't, I don't have all the details of that. I have read about it in the past, but I don't remember all the details. Fig Solve says, good point, sees through. He didn't, Rick did not mention the dog walker, so maybe he did not see them. Hi, Kennedy. Um, I missed what Texas Peach said, but exactly. Rick should have been immediately considered a person of interest after the grocery store interview. Yeah, I have no clue how he was not. Obviously, the defense is going to come up with all these different accusations about the old bridge guy sketch, the young bridge guy sketch, Ron Logan. And the prosecution is probably going to have to finally reveal the reasons for a lot of this stuff. Sorry, I'm just looking for a comments related to what we're talking about. Emily and why did Libby take empty bridge pics? Well, their family said that they went to the bridge to take photos. So she seemed to be an active user of Snapchat. So I guess she wanted to share with her friends that they were at the bridge. Like, so she took a photo of the entire bridge and also of Abby walking on the bridge. We don't know if there are other photos or videos that she took that she did not upload to Snapchat. I'm sure that will, will be revealed at the trial. Deb says, there is a path that goes back into the woods on the left right before you get to the bridge. He could have hidden back there. Well, why is some 44-year-old guy going to the bridge in the afternoon and hiding in the woods? I mean, I get I get that you're saying that that is an option, but it doesn't make sense. It's like, he, he never said that, though, Deb. He said, I went to platform one, and then I sat on a bench. And he said something else. Give me one second. I have these various photos that I'll show. And as I think of stuff, I'll share them with you guys. Whoops. So Rick said he went to look at fish from 60 feet up on the bridge, which it is possible to see fish if the water is clear. Oh, oh this I have this person's name. Uh, give me a second. Hold on. One moment, please. No, I can't do that. Shoot. Mm -hmm. Give me one second. I have to change this file name before I share it with you guys because I don't want to share this person's real name. One moment, please. So Rick said he went to look at fish. Tom's having technical difficulties. Please bear with him. I haven't opened it. Hold on. Um, yeah, hold on. Who cares? <laughs> okay, Rick said he went to watch fish from the bridge. So this photo is from, I believe this is a photo that was taken between three and four o'clock on the day the girls were murdered. So 
that water does not look clear enough to me to see fish. So is Prosecutor Nick going to present and say, the defendant said he went to look at fish from the bridge and from this photo that was taken within two hours, jury members, can you see fish? Now, I know some people have talked about here, there were some supposed photos that leaked with um, Libby's sneaker, maybe some other item of clothing, and maybe Libby's um, tie-dye shirt. I don't see, some people speculated, could they have been caught up here? I don't know. I don't really see the sneaker. So I'm not sure if this is where those items got caught up, but that was just something I was thinking about since we were talking about Rick looking at fish from the bridge. Kelt, what time does Rick say he left? He said he left at 3.30. And during my evidence video about Rick, I looked into like cars and their computers and there's a lot of information because if you saw the um, Alec Murdoch trial, they had an amazing amount of like car information that really helped convict Alec Murdoch. So unfortunately, I don't know if five and a half years, the information on Rick's car is gonna still be there, but if Rick said he left at 3.30 and they still have this data from Rick's Ford Focus from February 13th, 2017, and it shows that he did not start his car again until like 4.10, 4.15, that's not gonna look very good for Rick, obviously. Hi, Kimberly, thank you for joining. You'll regret it. <laughs> Hi, KT. Nice to see you. KT, previously, we we're talking about Rick and um, eating paper. And KT said that it gives new meaning to document dump. And so I was going to talk about this later. Um, one of my subscribers, DNA King, he's a lawyer. And so he told me something which I found interesting that I'll share with you guys. I think he's a criminal defense lawyer. So he said that he tells his clients who are in jail to eat their pa the paper that they're given. He said the reason he does this is because if a client or a defendant is given a piece of paper that details like the crime scene and another jail inmate is able to actually see this piece of paper and like details from the crime, it's possible that that other inmate will then go to the warden and say that the defendant told me that this happened at the crime scene, but the defendant not, did not really do that. It was just what they read off of this piece of paper where this other inmate is trying to get a lesser sentence if they're saying, oh, the defendant confessed to me, give me a lower sentence. So that is just a reason why somebody might eat their paper, like their, their discovery, like Rick apparently did. However, Rick is in solitary confinement, so I don't know how many other inmates are partying in his jail cell that would require that. So that was just one thing that I found interesting that could be a reason why Rick was eating paper and having document dumps. Hi, Frick. Thank you. I guess somebody was asking when the trial starts Jari says it starts January 8th, 2024. As of now, I see a lot of people online saying if the trial ever happens, but it's been 10 months since Rick was arrested. It's been four months since early April when he supposedly made these confessions to his wife and his mom. At what point is Rick going to change his plea? And also people are expecting the trial to get pushed out, but Hopefully it's going to happen as soon as possible. Oh, let's see. Sorry, I'm looking for comments to highlight.
Hi, Big Bird 420. Nice to see you. The water from the chopper footage the following day looks dark, deep, and dirty. Yeah, I don't know how somebody could say that they were seeing fish. Actually, let me, I'm not trying to make Rick seem like he's totally lying. I believe in the helicopter footage, there's like kind of like waves in certain areas. And some people have said that there are very large fish in Deer Creek. And some of those waves, not near the searchers in the red suits in the water, people have speculated that they, they could be larger fish causing um, these waves in the water. So it could be possible that, I mean, Rick maybe did not know how dirty or unclear the Deer Creek was that day until he got there. I don't know. Well, my new phrase is time will tell. We'll just have to wait for the trial. Hi, Susan. I don't think he was hiding at all. He was dressed with face coverings and strolled around openly waiting for victims. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll wait until people are able to do comments under my video to see who has an actual scenario, how Rick does not see Abby and Libby. Eileen, hi. If Rick is giving an alibi, he may not have told the truth. The two witnesses were no longer able to speak. Yeah. Um, what am I thinking about here? So... Uh... Should I go back to my PowerPoint slides? <laughs> What's the next on my PowerPoint slides? Let me see. Okay, yeah, let's talk about something happy. Um, so you guys know Kelsey is Libby's sister and there's good news. She finally had her first child. She and her husband, Caleb, they had a baby girl named Ellie. This outfit says hand picked for earth by my auntie in heaven, which it's so sad to me. I mean. To me, this whole situation is some guy or guys thought of some stupid scenario and it ended up with these two girls that had their lives ended so early. And they're like Doug Carter talks about tentacles. It's like these family members who survived, they're the ones who are just like having to go through the rest of their lives with all these negative consequences of this guy's stupid actions. Like this little girl is never going to get to meet her aunt Libby. It's, it's, it's so horrible. So I wanted to share that for people who did not know about that. What is next? I'm not sure. Um, that's that. I already went through Rick looking at fish from the bridge. After that, I already just talked. I already talked about lawyer's perspective on eating paper. So let me stop sharing. Hold on. All right. I have one other major topic to talk about, but let me look at your comments to say what you're talking about. Anything else you guys want to talk about? The chat doesn't seem to be going by too fast. Kelt, how long is it reasonable to keep Rick in solitary confinement? Well, I don't know. I mean, there was some guy from Tippecanoe County Jail who I think committed suicide in the past week. So law enforcement is very concerned that they, they need Rick to stay alive for this trial or else people are going to freak out, excuse me, that Indiana Department of Corrections did not do a good job of keeping Rick alive for his trial. I mean, we all want... I mean, people think Rick is guilty, but he obviously deserves a fair trial. If he's truly innocent, then this is horrible what's been done to him, which if I was innocent and in Rick's position, I would have immediately sued everybody. I would have been on TV. And I know people are saying, well, not everybody acts like that, but 
I don't, I don't want to say that he's not acting innocent, but I'm sorry. Um, there was another guy from Indiana. His name is Larry Nasser. I believe he was a doctor for the U.S. gymnastics team, like the female gymnastics team, and he was molesting a lot of girls. And he finally got sentenced to jail or prison. And maybe a month ago, another prisoner stabbed him multiple times. So if Rick is let out of solitary confinement, do you really think every other prisoner is going to be like, hey, Rick, I'll be your best friend? Or are people going to try and hurt him? So I don't know what the option is to keep Rick safe until trial. I know people disagree, but I don't know. Hi, Big Fish, Small Pond. Nice to see you. So wasn't there four girls, not three? It seems like, yes, there were. So although there's a lot of discrepancies, in Rick's statement, he said he saw three girls near Freedom Bridge or at Freedom Bridge, which to me, I, I need some confirmation whether Rick passed them out in the open in the sun or, um, sorry, out in the sun or in the trails. Sorry, as I think of these things, I want to share these pictures. So this is a picture of the trail in the winter, and that's bench one. And I know people are very triggered by the, well, there's three juvenile descriptions in the PCA of what Rick was wearing. And it's basically three totally different descriptions. And people are upset about that, thinking that there's some other random guy in all black, which I don't think so. So why did I make this? I made this. This is not bridge guy actually on here. I took the bridge guy photo and I did edit it because my point is, for people who are upset saying that, how can these girls say they saw a man in black? I, I, the only edit I did is I took the exact same color on the right-hand side of Bridge Guy's jacket. I did not edit this at all from Libby's um, video. So I took that and I colored it in because out, if you remember on the Bridge Guy video, it looks like split down the middle where the sun and the shade it looks like the light, the lighter side is on the left. So I made it darker with this. So to me, that's a dark color. And this is out in the sun. So if you imagine, even with the no leaves on the trees, you can see the trail is somewhat dark. And so I think with a girl just like barely looking at this guy, they're passing, which I know people are like, you don't know that I was barely looking. I can see how these girls would say, I passed a guy who was wearing black more so with the jacket and not the jeans because obviously they're lighter but that's just something i wanted to share so so there were four juvenile girls witness four said she saw four of them leaving over the overpass it seems to me like i heard a rumor that three of the girls were kind of walking ahead and one of them was a little bit farther behind looking at her phone for at least a certain amount of time that she fell behind and also the fourth girl why is her description not in the PCA. I believe she was too young. She was the younger sister of one girl. I don't know her exact age, but I saw a picture of two girls on bench one from 126, which we've heard about this 126 picture from bench one. And from what I've seen, I don't know for sure that it's real. No, I'm not sharing it. Sorry. There are two girls. One girl on the left looks um, maybe 10 years old. And to the right, I believe it's her older sister who was maybe like 15 or 16 or so. And one other thing about that. So we were talking about before exculpatory and inculpatory evidence in favor of Rick. So one of these girls said, the guy I passed was wearing jeans, a blue windbreaker, had something covering his head. I believe she also said he had something covering his mouth. His hands was were in his pocket and he was looking down, which it's like, that's a total description of Rick or sorry, of the person on the bridge and Rick's little feet down here. And Rick's like, I showed before his khakis are kind of like bunched up at the bottom and the jeans, I know people will disagree, but whatever. Um, what am I talking about? I don't know. I lost my train of thought. I don't know. 
Oh yeah. So people talk about bridge guy and Rick having his, um, sorry, a hoodie over his head. From what I've seen, the high temperature that day was 43 degrees. In my first Delphi video, I showed the screen captures from that webcam um, of that building that was being built by Indiana Packers, which I showed because um, there was that white work truck from like 1.30 to 3.30 o'clock or so that I was curious, was that involved in the crime? So what I'm getting at is the younger girl in this 1.26 p.m. selfie of these two sisters who were on bench one, the girl on the left is wearing a light sweatshirt and she does have her hoodie over her head. So it's not like totally suspicious that Rick had a hoodie on. It was 43 degrees. I know some people who are local were saying, well, this day, even though it was only 43, our winters in Indiana are very cold and it was very sunny out. And so we wanted to get out. It was unusually warm and you guys can decide your opinions on that. So that's that. What else? Yeah. So I don't know why Rick said he saw, he passed three juveniles. Where's the fourth one? Was she in a different area by the time they got to freedom bridge? Were they passing him actually on the trails in the cover of the trees or not? I don't know. So if they passed Rick in the out in the open by freedom bridge, where it's totally sunny, then totally disregard what I just said. I'm not frozen. I'm looking for comments. Let's see. Hi, Anne. Nice to see you. Have we ever yet seen the probable cause affidavit for the search of Lil Ricky's home? Not what they took out, but ground for getting the search warrant in the first place. I do not think so. I should probably know since I did a video of, of all 118 unsealed documents. Yes or no? Did they release this PCA to search Rick's home initially. Oh my gosh. How about we put our comments in an order on Excel spreadsheet for you? That would be helpful. And you can develop a function that links the same questions together. Oh my gosh. I wish. Let's see. Hi, Jackie. I'm happy to help you fall asleep. <laughs> what are we at? One hour and 52 minutes, maybe another hour. We have another major topic to talk to that I haven't seen anybody bring up yet. So, Hi, Gretchen. Nice to see you. This is a good point, Diana. DNA. Do you think they found any DNA at Rick's house? in his car, et cetera. Like, is there an evidence surprise with DNA? Two of my subscribers or viewers previously had some very good observations about DNA and whether they found Abby and Libby's DNA in Rick's car or Rick's DNA at the crime scene. One person said, do you think that when November 22nd, 2022, Slick Nick Mick, said a famous line, something along the lines of, we have good reason to believe there are other actors involved in this horrible or heinous crime, something along those lines. And so all of us were like, who else? <laughs> and it's been 10 months and we still haven't learned. So somebody who's smarter than me said, do you think the reason that Slick Nick Mick said that is because they first interviewed Rick on October 13th. And it looks like they were like, here, Rick, here's an Aquafina water bottle. We don't want you to be thirsty. And then when he finished the interview, they're like, okay, we'll take that back for DNA testing. So like a month later, five weeks later, they probably would have been able to test Rick's DNA against the crime scene. So this viewer said, do you think that the other actors meant that Rick's DNA did not match the crime scene? So 
law enforcement was like, okay, maybe there is somebody else involved. Or, I mean, it could be that the DNA at the crime scene, I think we've heard that it might be touch DNA that there's not a good sample of. I have no clue. I believe Tobe at some point said they do have DNA. Um, the other good point that somebody else made was, what is that called? Um, motion in limine or something? I don't know. Basically, the defense has previously asked the court for some like secret hearings without the prosecution where the defense is asking for an expert for ballistics. Because one of the major points of the PCA is that unspent round at the crime scene. No, it's a false alarm. Um, which we'll, get, we'll we can get into that in the sixth hour. So what is important about this? The defense is asking for money from the state to hire an expert to deny the ballistics gun cartridge evidence. They have not asked for an expert to deny DNA evidence. Excuse me. As far as we know. So don't you think if they found Abby and Libby's DNA in Rick's car, which for those of you who don't know, they swabbed five areas of Rick's car. I don't remember exactly where it was. So I know one thing was in the trunk, one or two spots maybe on the passenger's floorboard, floor mat, and maybe once on the driver's seat, the waist belt, and also the chest belt. And so I did some research and some other people told me that there's a chemical called luminol that is used a lot at these crime scenes. And I think you can pour the liquid or spray it onto a lot of different surfaces. And when this specific chemical interacts with blood, it turns the blood blue for, I don't know how long, maybe an hour or so. So it seems like, and I'm, this is not confirmed, did law enforcement spray luminol in Rick's car? And there were five areas that turned blue. And then they swabbed those areas to test if th that was blood and was it Abby and Libby's blood. But if Abby and Libby's blood and DNA were found in Rick's car months ago, don't you think there would have been an expert hired by the defense to deny how reliable that is? Oh my gosh. Um, whoops, I didn't mean to highlight that one. Hi, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Trav. Thank you. I don't agree with that, but thank you. Meerkat, they cut a piece of the carpet from under the spare tire. So I was talking previously, like five hours ago, about the computer of a car can tell, in my research, it can tell when Rick opened his trunk. So... Hopefully, if Rick is guilty and this information is still on the car computer system five and a half years later, which I'm really concerned that it got deleted, will it show that on February 13th, 2017, Rick opened the trunk to his car at 411 and the last time he had his car was on it was at like 128 and it was parked and they can have GPS showing it was parked at CPS that entire time, did he put some kind of item from the crime scene, like Meerkat says, under the spare tire? Will that show Abby or Libby's DNA? But like I said, against that, we have not seen that the defense is asking for a DNA expert to try and get that thrown out. Hi, Melissa. Um, you're welcome. Thank you for joining. I'm going to do some random comments, and then I'll get into this last topic, which none of you have brought this up, like the latest news that everybody's talking about. Anne says, my favorite part of Lil Ricky's story is that he was also checking a stock market ticker on his phone. So got stocks, but begged for freebie lawyers. Well, freebie for him, Indiana taxpayers picked up the tab. 
it'll be interesting to see from Rick's, I mean, I don't know that they're getting his bank records, but I don't know if the prosecution is going to say Rick, I, I, sorry, I hate the way I say Rick. I'm always like, I wind up like Rick, sorry. You're okay, Tom, don't worry about it. Nobody's watching. Um, what history does Rick have about caring about a stock ticker? Because it seems like in his first interview, or maybe it was his second one, I forget which one it was. He said he was looking at a stock ticker, which pretty much seemed like he was like, oh yeah, I was looking at my phone. So don't know if I passed anybody on this really wide trail. Um, yeah, so it'll be interesting, and to see if there's anything brought up by the prosecution, like he ain't checking stocks. Okay, yes, yeah, Samantha, motion in limine. Thank you for your expertise. Hi, Jackson. What's always really puzzled me is how everything happened supposedly in such a small window of time. I don't know. I personally feel there is still much we don't know and others potentially involved. Well, like I was just talking about with these other actors, how has it been um, 10 months since Rick was arrested and the prosecution and law enforcement has had 10 months to try and see any connections via whatever, electronics or whatever, and nobody else has been charged. There's something else that you said that I was, um, all, I mean, it's kind of random, but kind of connected. It just seems so crazy to me that Rick or somebody else thought that they could kidnap somebody and down the hill, and they don't know who could show up on the bridge. It's like, it was really risky. I mean, that sounds stupid, but sorry. <laughs> Cecil Hotel, nice to see you. Thank you. I'm glad you appreciate my suffering. <laughs> yeah, I have um, motive. Do you want to talk about motive or no? I have a spreadsheet, but it's not properly formatted, so I don't want to show it. Um, how do I? Okay, I'm gonna talk about motive and you guys can type comments. What do you think motive? So I'm gonna take like, this might take five minutes for me to ramble from one thing to another. I've tried to think, I mean, it just seems so crazy to me that this guy who worked at the local CVS in a customer facing position where it's not a small town and CVS, it's a pharmacy for people who are in Poland and don't know what it is. And it's not just for medicine. There's a lot of like various items that you can go. So there's just a lot of items. So a lot of people would be going to this CVS park or not parking lot, but the CVS. So just, I just can't understand how this guy who's 44 years old at this time is married. I mean, his wife seemed happy in the marriage. I don't know about him. Um, that's not shady, but he, he just doesn't seem like a happy person. Obviously the defense that he suffered from depression since her, his early years. I just don't know what would cause this guy to go to the trails that day if Rick is the person who did this alone. So my current motive that is the only thing I can think of before, like the Rick's lawyers released something like a few pages, like defending him saying he's innocent. And then the year or sorry, the day, a day later, the judge is like, okay, time for a gag order. So in that defense press release, they said something about Rick going to the trails. And I think the quote was, which he often did. So he lived in Delphi for 11 years. He moved there in 2006. And so he was 33 years old at the time he and his wife and his daughter moved. I think they're um, in Mexico, which is maybe 25 minutes away. They moved to Delphi. I don't know if he had gone to these trails before they moved there in 2011, but or 2006, I'm sorry. So if Rick has been going to these trails for 11 years before the murders, how often was he going there? The defense says he often went there. How often did he go there by himself? How often did he stay there on this mile trail that takes 30 minutes approximately going from Freedom Bridge to the this part of the bridge and back? How long did he stay there for two hours, like sitting on a bench for 90 minutes? Okay, so my 
motive is, did he pass teenage girls over the years? And as some people are saying in the comments, did he start having some kind of fantasy about teenage girls? And people wonder, why would he do this to two girls? Why did he not do this to the three girls, or sorry, the three or four girls near Freedom Bridge, which to me, I'm going to ramble and go to certain areas. So give me a break here. Um, if he was truly there just to look at fish, why did he take the long way from his home? Although I don't know that he came from his home, but the way he went to CPS is not the quickest way from his house. It's like five minutes longer, I think. My speculation is he had this fantasy and so he has to drive past Mir's lot to see if anybody's parked there. Because if he was looking to go see the fishies, why would he not park at Mir's and then just walk to the bridge? So I feel like he had to see if anybody was at Mir's, which as far as we know, there was not because that was at 127. He was on uh, Hoosier Harvester camera. Witness four says at 146, she pulls in and nobody is at Mir's. So I feel like he had to park at CPS, even though he calls it the old Farm Bureau building. It's not. He parked at CPS. There's no way he parked anywhere else and passed these juveniles. He had to park there and walk the entire trail to see if anybody else is on this trail, like the entire trail. However, I don't know if he looked down 505, which I talked about at Mirrors. That's what goes down to the creek. He should have checked if somebody was down there. I don't know how off or how much time. He should have had a few minutes around the Mears intersection because as far as we know, nobody else was really at this far end of the trails at, when he was in this area. So was he planning this fantasy for a while? Because if you look at Bridge Guy's jacket, I know you all know, like there's items stuffed in his jacket. It looks very unnatural. I don't care how big his beer belly is from drinking Jägermeister. It's not just a beer belly with that stuff protruding. I told you I'll, I'll ramble. So I'm getting to my point. What's my point? So did he go to these trails with this fantasy to trap two girls at the end of the bridge, make them go down the hill? I don't know if his intent all along was to walk across this cold creek to what he thought was maybe a safe area on the north side of the creek on Ron Logan's property. But I, I just can't imagine him wanting them, wanting them to go down the hill and doing something out in that open where the private drive is and anybody could drive by at any time. So my motive that I keep like delaying, if he had a fantasy that was sexual, but he knew he could not do something to one girl and transfer his DNA, was his fantasy to point a gun at two teenage girls and say, I want you to get undressed and touch each other. I mean, th that's just my motive that I can think of is, I don't know, I'm sure some of you guys disagree with that, but if his DNA did not really touch their clothing, as far as we know, any kind of DNA evidence, did he want to force them to touch each other? Which also leads to this unspent round found two feet from Libby's body. I'll get to your comments in a little bit. So just let me ramble. It's, it's my specialty. I've speculated before about this unspent round. At one point I was wondering when he gets to the end of the bridge, there's speculation that on the audio where it says, guys go down the hill in between people think you can hear like the slide of a handgun being pulled back. Some people debate whether that's the sound. I previously wondered if he did do that to scare them at the end of the bridge and one of these cartridges pops out as he does that, did he lean over and pick it up and put it in his right hand or like his jacket pocket? Then later at the crime scene when he was moving bodies around or something, did that cartridge fall out unbeknownst to him and he didn't realize it until he got home or whatever later? Sorry. So my new, which I'm allowed to change my theories, hopefully i'm not familiar with guns so i appreciate a lot of people in the past who are familiar with guns kind of enlightened me i don't know how much i rem remembered so 
there's like a cartridge. It's not called a bullet. It's called a cartridge, which they call it an unspent round in the PCA. But it's like a round or a cartridge. It's not a bullet because there's like four different, sorry, four different parts to a cartridge. And the bullet is in a casing or, I don't know, I'm messing up already. My point is when he's maybe pointing the gun at the crime scene saying, I want you to touch each other. And they're looking at each other like, we don't want to. Did he again pull back the slide on the gun or did he do it for the first time? And there was already a cartridge in there, which popped out. Did he maybe not see it pop out? Did he see it, but he did not want to, like he wanted them to like proceed to doing what he wants them to do. He didn't have time to look in under the leaves and stuff. So that's my latest theory about how he could possibly have um, had his car his cartridge end up at the crime scene. Two other things that I want to bring up about that. People are debating a lot how reliable um, any kind of scientific analysis is of that cartridge being tied to Rick's pay, I'm sorry, P226 Sig Sauer handgun. The reason I'm bringing this up is because if you remember at the beginning of this case, I think it was February 16th or you know, the 16th, there was a search warrant on Bicycle Bridge Road. I'm not going to say the last name of these people, so hopefully you guys can be respectful and just not say the person's name. But who lived at, on Bicycle Bridge Road and why was it searched very soon after? Apparently there's a teenage boy, I'm not going to say his name. He had maybe been talking to Libby on social media. He may have gone to the same school, I'm not sure. Or I'm not sure if they were friends, but also Libby's aunt, Tara, said that she saw this boy walking, I don't know if it was around the railroad tracks or whatever, around the afternoon. There's another rumor that that boy's father was so seen at the Marathon gas station wearing clothing similar to Bridge Guy. So that might be the reasons why law enforcement searched this house on Bicycle Bridge Road like a few days after the murders. Why I'm bringing this up is because there's also a rumor that police took a handgun from Bicycle Bridge Road. I'm bringing it up because I'm comparing it to did they do analysis on that handgun comparing it to the unspent round in a few days after the murders and it did not match the handgun at bicycle bridge road and also there's another guy who lived near the trails back here or his mom did and there's another unconfirmed rumor that he had a handgun that was also taken for a few months and analyzed so did his handgun also not match as being a match to this unspent round found at the crime scene. So I know people have concerns that it's not very good science, but if I'm a jury member and Slick Nick Mick says, well, we tested these two other local handguns and they did not match this unspent round. But when we tested Rick's, the, the whatever, the law enforcement analysis person said, yes, in my opinion, it is subjective. But this person said, yes, we think it is a match to Rick's gun. So um, I don't know. That's just something that some people may have not may not have known that there's a rumor that at least two other local handguns were tested against this unspent round. And I'm finished rambling. Let's see what you guys are rambling about. Kelt says racking it on the bridge brought one up in the chamber. He racks again across the creek and it pops out. Maybe. OK, yes, that could be true. I'm more than happy for people to disagree. Anne says, really like, but don't like that motive. Th oh, sorry. I thought you were disagreeing. Anne agrees with my motive that he wanted two girls to do things to each other because it explains how he could think he could get away with that with two girls and then panic and unplanned, escal sorry, unplanned escalation makes a lot of sense. I mean, I just don't see how he could have thought that he could have gone back to working at CVS and... I mean, if you thought he could maybe have girls do this to each other and then have them not end up coming into CVS and recognizing him, I, I don't know, was his plan all along to do this and then to murder? I, I don't know. I mean, one of the witnesses said he had his um, 
head covered and his mouth covered. So it seems like bridge guy as he's walking, he does have his head covered, but we can't see if he definitely does have some kind of mouth covering. I'm not going to speculate because it's just way too um, blurry. Although it does look like a goatee. If I have to say, I would say he's not wearing the mouth covering as he approaches because he did not want to scare them as he's getting closer. Let's see. High cult cult. There's maybe another cult that I know about. Cult is uh, named after a handgun. I need to discuss this gun ballistics dropped round issue. Me and my father have combined 90 years experience is ammo loading and ballistics is major and no one has caught on to the fatal flaw. Let me look and see if you ended up saying another comment following up on that. Sorry, I have like 45 seconds between when people can comment to keep down, uh, slow down the chat. Oh, let's see. Colt says it's very long and involved, but will if you all and Tom don't mind. Yeah, it's hard to say um, to share. If you want to do it, hopefully I'll see your comment in a little bit. And hi I'll highlight it so you can enlighten me and other people. Oh, wait, here we go. Forget what Fig wants. Let me get to the cult. The Sig Sauer P226 is a tactical military and police pistol, meaning they have never had external safeties. Yeah, this is going to be difficult doing one thing at a time. No offense. I, I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, Colt, if you don't mind, after the live chat is over, if you can write a comment under the video so other people can actually read it instead of me trying to highlight a bunch of comments. I hope you're not offended. I'm just trying to hear your expertise so everybody can actually find out later. Um, what does this man want to say? Yes, Rackett wants to get them to go down the hill. The bullet, that's not a bullet, Fig. It's a cartridge. You need to learn your lingo. The cartridge gets chambered, then racked again to get them to stop. And that's when it was ejected at the murder scene. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know that we're ever going to find out, but I don't know if um, the prosecution is going to uh, speculate what they think happened. Hi, until tomorrow. Nice to see you. What does he have to contribute? I want to know. I don't know what you're, who you're talking about. And do we know, sorry, do we know Rick went to work at CVS afterwards? I think the whole timeline of his entire day as forensically determined is going to be very interesting. From what I've heard, people do work on weekends at CVS. Obviously, they're open seven days a week. So it seems like he had the entire day off on Monday because I think they close at 10 o'clock or maybe even 8 o'clock in Delphi. So I do not think that he went to CVS on the 13th after he committed these murders. Big fish, small pond. I just don't get why he did not come up with a story about why his bullet could have been there or that no one else used it. Also, he just went into the police station. I, he, he said he did not know Ron Logan which I might get to Ron Logan later. I don't know. We'll see. Um, let Ron rest in peace. Um, and he said he never let anybody borrow his gun. So how did your cartridge supposedly get over there? Miranda, I'm serious. You should really look up Mind Shock podcast. I've seen his videos and I said I won't say anything bad about other YouTube creators, and I'm not saying anything bad, but his sped up voice, it, it triggers me. Like my normal voice triggers other people. So <laughs> they did use your work. So I don't know if the guy asked you or not. I don't care. People, he, he did mention me and he said, I'm a, what did he say? I'm a freak. No, I'm a something research, astute researcher. That was from my satellite image, which provided nothing for this case. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to decline that, but no, no shade. <laughs> Morgan says, I also find it interesting where the PCA knows the Ford 
was spotted throughout the day. He visited Peru, Indiana, where he grew up, before driving back roads. Sounds like inner turmoil. Are you sure? What are you talking about, Morgan? Have you been having some Jack Morgan? Or is that is that a drink? I don't know. I don't drink. Captain Morgan. Sorry, not Jack. Captain Jack Morgan. Um, the the PCA only says at 127, Rick's Ford Focus was captured on the Hoosier Harvestor camera, which is right near the trails in Delphi. Um, and it does not mention a time where Rick's car was seen going back. So did he go back through the town of Delphi? There was a mention, I think the defense team said they have to go through thousands of hours of surveillance video. So it seems like the FBI and other local or state law enforcement around the time of the murders went around to these businesses trying to capture video. So after they figured out that Rick was a suspect and drove this dark black um, Ford Focus, did they go back through all this um, surveillance video from whatever, February 13th or even days before? to see where Rick was going and hanging out or driving and which way did he go home and at which time? Because if he says, I left at 3.30, even if his computer data in his car is no longer there, hopefully they can maybe piece together, Rick, we see your car going through Delphi at 4.15. What up, bro? Let's see. Drink time. Hi, Susan. Oops. Hi, Susan. I don't believe it was random. I think he was privy to their plans for the day. I don't know. I mean, they've had Libby's phone since the very beginning. Even if he was using a catfish profile, wouldn't they have seen any interaction between Rick and Libby, even if it was like a fake profile that Rick was behind? It seems like the girls were telling other people, yeah, we're going to the bridge that day. Some people think like, oh, because Anthony Schatz said I was supposed to meet her and she didn't show up that Libby maybe made, made plans to people, but it could have been something where she could have been talking to somebody and said, yeah, over this weekend, we're going to maybe, maybe head out to the trails on Sunday or Monday or something. There's another issue where people have said that Abby was not allowed to have a phone. However, it seems like she had a tablet and she did. I mean, there's screenshots and stuff where she is talking to Libby. I don't know that's 100% accurate. I'm not going to share it, but I think it was like an Instagram private chat chain that somebody videotaped like the chat after the murders just as like evidence. It's, it's not like official police evidence. It's like the family shared it or something. So we don't know exactly what Abby was doing on her social media. I know that police got a warrant for two email addresses, two email addresses registered to Abby. So it's possible that, I don't know, Abby could have been saying that she's going to the trails that day and maybe Rick somehow saw it. I, I don't know. I mean, one thing that I keep thinking of is that Abby, Libby and Rick all lived in a fairly close geographical area. And some of these like dating apps, which I mean, I don't know, not necessarily even dating apps, but social media, you can kind of see who is in your area. So if Rick was catfishing, Abby and Libby would definitely show up as being very close to where he was living. So, I mean, I don't know at this point, I've not seen anything about um, Rick catfishing Abby or Libby. So it could have just been this fantasy, as I was saying before, that Rick had for years and it finally presented itself, unfortunately, this day. And Abby and Libby just happened to be the girls who <sighs> it happened to. Fig solves replies to Kennedy. Ron Logan's was a search warrant. Rick's was a was an arrest warrant, not apples to apples. All right. Thank you for clarifying. Colt says, good idea to write a long comment for everybody to read after I'm put out of my misery with these, this chat. I could never offend him. You have impeccable character and class. I don't know about that, but thank you. Yes, 
cult, please, I'll try and end this as soon as possible. <laughs> So you can leave a comment. I don't think you can leave a long comment until after the live chat is over. Hi, Thierry. Hopefully that's how you pronounce your name. Does anybody know when Rick's daughter had her picture taken on the bridge? Obviously, most of us have seen this. I think it's a black and white photo of Rick's daughter at the start of the bridge there. I believe it's at the start. Some people have said it was for her graduation. I don't know if it was for her high school graduation or I think she graduated in uh, I don't know, from college at some point. Um, she was 22 years old in 2017, from what I can tell. So from what I've seen, I do not believe that that picture was after Abby and Libby were killed. I might be wrong, but I don't know. Digital, if there is video that clearly shows Bridge Guy's face, why did they not release it? at least one frame of that. I, I don't think they have it digital. Nobody is talking about me. Tom answers questions very dumbly. I'll agree. Colt, no, sorry. Like I said, you have to unfortunately go watch cat videos for another two hours and then come back and I'll be done. <laughs> Or start typing up what you want to say, and then I know you like to write long comments, so I, I appreciate them. Hopefully, you'll finish by the time I'm done. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for some comments. We still have some major stuff to talk about. Two and a half hours already? Oh, my gosh. I'll get to... Oh, yeah. Babu's Frick, Ron Logan is dead. Oh, yeah. So I have never done a poll. And no, I have not danced on a stripper poll. Um, here's my first poll. Did it show up? Hold on. One moment, please. Did it show up? Did you guys see the poll? My poll is... Some people think that Ron Logan is bridge guy. So please... Take my poll and say yes or no. Currently, 93% say Ron is not bridge guy. While you're doing that, oh, it's down to 92. I'm going to share, this is my final time talking about Ron Logan as bridge guy. I'm not kidding. This is gonna take 10 minutes. So if you want, if you don't care about this, go get a snack or something. This is my la absolute last time talking about Ron Logan as bridge guy. Um, I'm, I'm not, look, not looking at your comments until I'm done. So bear with me. Let me take off Babu Frick. Hold on. One moment, please. Oops. All right. I'm sharing my spreadsheet for the last time about Ron. Before I start this, hi, everybody who believes Ron Logan is bridge guy. Don't be mad at me. I try and do reasons for and against everything. I'm not out to get Ron Logan or or make it seem like Rick is definitely a bridge guy. Feel free to add your facts or suggestions why Rick is, or sorry why Ron is bridge guy, and I will have an open mind. Here we go. Let me make it one thing bigger. So my last time talking about Ron Logan as bridge guy. So these are reasons for Ron as bridge guy. Mostly these are for him as bridge guy. I do not believe he was bridge guy because of what I'm about to share. Whether he had anything to do with it other, I mean, besides um, being a bridge guy, I don't know for sure. I do not think some 77 year old guy is doing a bunch of different video on camera interviews at the crime scene where people think he murdered these two girls and this old guy is thinking he's going to be able to go on inside edition and like act like he's not involved or not the murderer i know people are like freaking out but here we go 10 minutes of ron logan not bridge guy so reasons against ron as bridge guy 
he lived closest to the crime scene. So obviously people are going to um, suspect him due to that reasons for, oh, sorry, reasons for is because people tipped him in. And my thing against that is because they were found on his property. Obviously people are going to say that. Um, Ron created a false alibi. My belief is that he needed an alibi because he knew if law enforcement found out he drove to the aquarium, he might go to and die in jail. This man was 77 years old. I know there's been speculation that he was able to drive around Delphi and that the local police would allow him to drive around Delphi. However, this aquarium is a lot farther. And also people say that he only asked his cousin for an alibi for like two o'clock at the time of the murders. And he did not ask his cousin for an alibi at around noon, sorry, around noon when he went to the um, transfer station for recycling. However, he, he gave, he talked to a police officer and he told that officer that his cousin drove him to the um, transfer station. So even though he did not ask his cousin for an alibi, he gave this alibi that he did not drive to the transfer station. Cause I feel like, I mean, if you're 77 years old and you know, you might go to jail for violating your suspended license due to drunk driving, driving, you're, you're going to be afraid to die in jail. So I think to me, that is a decent reason for an old man to want to have an alibi. And I know people say, well, he asked the cousin at 9 30 AM or whatever, before the girls were found a few hours later, he didn't even know that um, they were dead. However, he knew that there were a bunch of people looking in the woods and that these two girls had still not been found and that the police would probably come and come and ask him, what were you doing at this time? So I know people get whatever upset about his alibi being a reason why he might have been the murderer, but yeah. I just feel like he did it because of his drunk driving uh, charges. Um, in the search warrant, the FBI said his phone pinged near the bridge and the crime scene. I believe one of those times was 2.09 in the afternoon. Obviously at 2.13 is when Libby recorded bridge guy. And people say, well, he was at the bridge at the same time. We don't know that for sure. We don't know exactly the radius where um, this whatever cell phone report, how, how accurate it is. It was, his house was not that far away. Also, just a reminder, police moved on from Ron Logan six years ago. They thoroughly in investigated him. They have access to a lot more evidence than we do. If this 209 phone call on his phone records showed that he was on the phone for five minutes or more, that would be 214. So if he's bridge guy, why is he connected to his cell phone, yet his hands are in his pocket and he's not talking on the phone? I don't know for sure if he was on one minute or five minutes, but I'm just saying that's a possibility. Going along. I have no idea what you guys are saying. So give me five more minutes for this. Reasons against Ron as bridge guy. He was captured on transfer station video around noon, wearing boots up to his knees, dark blue jeans, a coat that did not match bridge guy and no hat or head covering. Nothing matched bridge guy's clothes two hours later. The blue jacket in interviews has a large logo that a lot of these people who think he's bridge guy seem to ignore when, yeah, here we go. So I'm showing these photos. Um, people reference this interview and they say, he's wearing the same jacket as bridge guy. But that's when her microphone was covering this logo and then she moves it. And this logo, I know that Libby's video is very blurry, but that logo would have shown up. I don't care how dark it is over here. So let's go down here. Thank you to Fig Solves who shared this video. This is Ron Logan at the transfer station. I know the timing was a little bit off, but he was there from like 1153 to 1158 approximate time. He has boots up to his knees. His jeans are darker than bridge guys. This is not bridge guys jacket. He has no head covering. He's been drinking some Jägermeister too. He has a big beer belly. I don't know for sure that bridge guy is not wearing this blue jacket, but I'm sorry, this blue shirt. So I made this composite here. If this guy, Ron Logan, 
after 53 years on this property is like today's the day that i'm gonna go walk over here and try and kidnap assault murder girls on my property oh sorry and i'm gonna take them down the hill and i'm gonna take them across the creek why would he remove these big ass boots actually i think he has two big ass boots up to his knees i think these are different than up here but if he knows he's going across a very cold creek abducting girls why would he change to these small shoes that does not make sense to me older men no shade but they usually wear like darker dungarees like a darker jean those might be more blue than these however these are not the same as these this jacket is not the same color as this this jacket is not the same as that here is his hat i don't think that's the same as that i know some people thought like there's a pin up here i don't agree with that that's a gray mustache i don't think that's a gray mustache he wears prescription glasses i don't see them i know it's very blurry so let's go back up here to my little spreadsheet i'll get to your comments and the final poll results in five minutes this is my last time doing ron logan as bridge guy body proportions don't match bridge guy like I said, why would he remove boots up to his knees if he knew he was about to force two two girls across a high level cold creek, wore prescription glasses, bridge guy did not appear to be wearing glasses. His ex-wife said he was terrified of heights and did not go on the bridge. She said he would not go further than three um, feet out on the bridge. And bridge guy's voice was not Ron. I know the uh, FBI in their search warrant said his voice could be bridge guy i believe they worded it as his voice is not inconsistent with bridge guy and if you've seen seen my really long video on the clients and my 28 minute section on ron logan i mean this in order for ron to be bridge guy it has to be his voice saying go down the hill the voice of bridge guy is not a 77 year old man i've said this before but i mean you guys all have to admit if you hear a voice sample of a 20 year old guy or 20 anybody a 20 year old a 44 year old and a 77 year old we all know that our grandparents no, no offense i know i have people in their 70s who are um watching we love older people and their experience but like as people's voices age they i mean they change and we all know that they do so to me i, I mean i've heard ron say go down the heel but we've also heard a bunch of other voice samples from Ron and he talks like an old grandpa. I've said before, like if you're a voice acting casting agent and you need like some old hick grandpa voice and your two audio samples are Ron Logan from his many on-camera TV interviews and bridge guy saying guys and down the hill, which voice would you choose for your grandpa character? And to me, bridge guy does not sound like a grandpa, but Ron Logan does. So it does not match Ron's voice. I'm sorry, it just does not. Ron's gray mustache does not match bridge guys. The police thoroughly investigated him and never charged him. None of the unknown fibers, hairs, unspent round matched items at uh, Ron's house. His gun did not match the unspent round at the crime scene. Uh, the witnesses on the trail, including witness four, who saw Rick on platform one, saw ron during his uh, several tv interviews but none of them said that he was bridge guy um so don't you think if they were like oh yeah we passed bridge guy oh that's ron logan they would have told police would a 77 year old give multiple local and national on-camera interviews thinking he was a good enough actor to hide his guilt when he could have just not answered his doorbell for reporters i just don't think he would do that I'm going to get to maybe some really passive aggressive scenario in a few seconds. <laughs> Almost done. May 2022. Superintendent Doug Carter said, I would like to remind the public that this is an active and sorry, that this is an active and ongoing investigation. And we will do everything we can to protect its integrity and to not try it in the court of public opinion. We cannot publicly convict someone, Ron, based on a single document, Ron's search warrant which was not released by investigators. So Doug, Dougie Fresh did not specifically say 
that this was in relation to Ron, but this was soon after, I believe, Ron's search warrant was leaked and everybody freaked. Hi, Babu, Babu Freak. If Ron thought he needed an alibi and left quickly for the aquarium and thought he would be able to move the body somewhere else at night, why would he spend time staging the crime scene before he went to the aquarium? Unless people think he went to stage the bodies at night. I don't know. I mean, we've heard that there were a bunch of people in the woods. You really think Ron snuck in there? I know that people say, well, the search warrant for Ron's house by the FBI said that his phone pinged maybe at like 10 o'clock in the area of the crime scene. But like I said before, we don't know how accurate that cell data was um, in early March of 2017. And the police moved on from Ron. So any further extensive investigations that they did of this data, it obviously did not show up with enough evidence to charge him. Um, Ron lived on that property for 53 years and never committed this act before. That's one of my reasons against Ron as bridge guy. However, people can also say Rick was 44 and never committed this act before. How was Rick Allen on the bridge at 153 when witness four um, saw him? But uh, Rick said he did not see anybody. So he did not say, oh yeah, I saw Ron Logan hanging out in the woods. Um, against this, it was 20 minutes before bridge guy encountered the girl. So if you want to come up with an excuse or sorry, a scenario, <laughs> A scenario how Rick can maybe get off the platform and Ron was hiding in the woods and then he shows up around whatever 205 or something then I guess that is a possibility however as I've said before Rick saying he goes from platform one to a bench without seeing Abby and Libby does not make um, make sense against Ron being bridge guy we've heard that Rick has made multiple confessions which the defense has said he admits to the charge um, what he's charged with I said this before, how long did his 209 call last? How could he make a call and four minutes later be seen approaching Abby and Libby at the end of the bridge? The timing does not add up to me. I don't know what's down here, let's see. Against, um, well, people could say reasons for Ron's bridge guy, the bodies were found on his property. However, against that, it was a large property and the girls were found close to the creek, which is, it's, it's a far distance from his house. Um, people say Ron has a history of abuse of women. Those women, um, those were women he knew, not strangers, not two teenage girls. So here's my little passive aggressive scenario that I'll say, and then I'll wrap, wrap up Ron. I mean, just to me, it does not make sense that this 77 year old guy who has lived on this property for 53 years, hold on, I'll come on camera and people can hate watch me. Hi to everybody who hate watches my live chats in Discord groups and complains about everything I say. That's fine. Let's all get along with our different theories. So if I'm offending you and you believe Ron is bridge guy, I'm sorry. But as you just saw on my spreadsheet, I try and think of reasons for and against. And I'm just saying that the reasons against Ron as bridge guy, it just seems overwhelming to me that it's not him. So my little passive aggressive um, final scenario. You really think that some 77 year old guy who lived on this property for 53 years, one day he's like, today's the day I'm going to walk over here and abduct two girls and have them go down the hill and I'm going to go across the creek and I'm going to kill them right at the edge of my property. But first I have to go do my recycling at noon and then I'll get home around 12, 15 and then I'm going to change my boots. Even though I have to cross the creek above my knees, I'm going to wear really small boots and not my big white boots. And then I'm going to change my jeans and I'm going to change my jacket and I'm going to put a hoodie on. And then I, it just does not add up to me. So, sorry. And in order for it to be Ron, it has to be his voice. It's not his voice. The poll, let me close the poll. 94% say it's not bridge guy. So, oh, there it is. Hold on. So I will now look at your comments. I'm sorry if I triggered you, but I just have to be honest. Uh, let's see. 
Sorry, give me a second. Please hold. I'm more than happy to show your comments with reasons for Ron. And if if it's a good comment or a good reason for him being a bridge guy, I'm more than happy to add it to my iconic spreadsheet. Let me get a drink. Drink, everybody. Hi, Annie. Nice to see you. I'm glad you made it. I don't know if that's the truth, but my voice is getting tired. It's always tired. Two hours and 45 minutes. Oh, my gosh. We still haven't gotten to, like, the main news stuff. So I'm going to do this Ron stuff, and then we'll talk about the big news of the last week. I'll highlight a variety of comments. Jari says, I agree. Ron is not a bridge guy. Did he have some um, guilty knowledge? Maybe. I agree. But he also has a letter where he wrote to the ACLU saying, with ACLU, I think they're like a law organization that kind of helps out people who don't have money for lawyers. Sorry. And I don't know. So, excuse me. He wrote this letter. I, I have it somewhere, but I can't highlight it right now. I don't know where it is. And he basically said, Carroll County and the FBI and the Indiana State Police have ruined my life by accusing me of being the Delphi killer. And I don't know. Do you really think that he would even bring up a possible lawsuit if he could not prove that he was not? I, I don't know. I know some people say, well, how is somebody supposed to act if they're not a killer or whatever? Um, and there's, I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll bring up what just popped into my mind. There is this letter that I also have, which I don't have it on this computer, by some guy named James Haas, H-A-A-S. And he apparently was in Carroll County Jail with Ron. I forget what this guy was in for him. But he wrote a letter to somebody saying, Ron, I heard Ron confessing to me, or he said Ron was... This is inappropriate, but he said Ron was touching himself inappropriately, saying Abby repeatedly. I don't know how if that's true or not. He also said that Ron admitted to killing the girls. So, I mean, I just want to put that out there that there is this letter. I don't, it's, I don't have it available right now, but I do have it somewhere. So I wanted to at least say that a reason possibly for Ron being involved somehow is these things, but it just doesn't, does not add up to me that this 77 year old guy is continuing to do on camera interviews. Like, Hey, sure. I'll talk to you. I mean, he had to do like at least five interviews and he took people willingly down to the crime scene. If you did this murder, are you really going to be within a few days? Like, Hey, inside edition, come to my backyard where I, where I killed these girls. I think I'm a good enough actor at 77 years old. Cause I did community theater. Um, I, I, it does not add up to me. I'm sorry. Let's see. Digital. I think Ron knew the type of characters he hung out with and hung out on his land. No telling what they would do on his land. I think there was some newspaper, very short, like snippet in the years prior where maybe Ron Logan called police that people were doing meth in the cemetery. And there's been a lot of rumors that people did meth in the woods. I don't know what that has to do with anything I'm talking about, but. Fig solves. Richard Allen was on the trails that day and said he did not see Ron Logan. Why would Rick lie about that? I, I, I agree. However, in my point against before, I said, I guess it is possible that Rick could have gotten off platform one within a minute or two of witness four seeing him. However, where would he go and not see Ron Logan and not see Abby and Libby? It does not add up to me in the against Ron as bridge guy and against Rick telling the truth. Four pit bulls. Ron Logan was tall and had a limp for all you lurkers. Yeah, just a reminder, police moved on from Ron Logan as bridge guy and as being involved at all six years ago. And I'm not really trying to like get everybody to think my exact way, but I mean, I just see people still talking about Ron as bridge guy and it does not add up to me. Um, Teary, I don't buy that for the reason of the alibi, me talking about him afraid going to jail. That's okay. 
but I don't think he was bridge guy. I think he's involved in some way. I think it's ridiculous that it took three weeks for law enforcement to even get a search warrant for his house or for his full search of his house. Um, I know that there was one search warrant maybe two weeks after the murders where they were only allowed to see if he had guns at the house, which would have been a pri uh, probation violation. So I just don't understand if two girls are found on somebody's property, even though it was far from his house, is that not good enough reason to get a search warrant on February 14th at 1 p.m.? I don't know. It's like, did they miss out on any potential evidence um, by having it take three weeks or more to do a full search of Ron's house? And just a reminder, I mean, they did an absolute full search of his house and his electronics, and they just never found anything to charge him with. And there was there were some charges, actually, this fake alibi, I think at first they charged him with, in, I forget what the exact um, description is, they charged him with like impeding the investigation by lying about his whereabouts and his alibi. However, they dropped that charge. So if you, if he really did have something to, something to do with Delphi, do you really think they would be like, oh, we'll, we'll let you get away with um, lying to us about Delphi? That doesn't add to me. Charmaine, Charmaine, what is your true crime podcast name? I'm happy to promote it. I love promoting everybody and their businesses. <laughs> I think the lurkers are just playing devil's advocate. No, you need to think again. No reasonable person, uh oh, you're in trouble, would still believe Ron Logan is the short, tubby guy in the video. Based on the pictures that I just showed and compared, I just don't think that's true. Newsflash, weather alert, people in Michigan, there are tornadoes right now, so please hide and don't pay attention to me. I hope everybody is safe. Nobody says Alan should be either the best suspect or the best witness. Well, he says he didn't see anybody in two hours after the juvenile. So I'm not highlighting that comment. I don't want trouble. <laughs> Hi, Venus gal. With respect, 400 people are watching. Hi, 400 people. It's been two hours and 52 minutes. We still have to get, to, after this Ron part, I'm getting to the final thing and then who knows what's going to happen. With respect, my mom is 80 and there is nothing she can't do the same as when she was 60. I am not sold on Ron's involvement, but I have not ruled it out. Venus gal, if you call her and somebody calls you and one of you picks up, do they think when you pick it up that it's your mom? I mean, you know, like old older people, it's just a different voice. And it's, I know I keep repeating the same thing, but I just can't get past it's not Ron Logan's voice saying, go down the hill. Ask McConnor, they also dropped the two charges related to Delphi. I think I already went over this. They had no reason to do that if they suspected Ron was involved. You must have been reading my mind or I read your comment before pretending I thought of it. Running on empty. I don't know what you're talking about, but thank you. Oh, that one's, that's so old, that green shirt. I'm um, that's from 2017. I need to update it. Look how horrible I look compared to that. <laughs> Louise, motive isn't always sexual, but more about power. Making them undress, creating fear is part of the role of power. Um, what was I thinking about? Oh, yeah. I did not mention this before. So we have seen these pictures where they're not totally confirmed, but they seem somewhat legit. In the creek, there are Libby's sneaker, which it does seem to be accurate. There's some fairly, there's like a white object in the middle, which some people wonder if that is Libby's underwear. And then to the left of that is a tie-dye shirt that people, I think Libby under her sweatshirt was wearing her tie-dye shirt that day. So I've said this before. I think that the killer, even though he may not, he may have tried to not transfer DNA, is it possible that he felt like he, if it's Rick alone, 
touched those three items and he was concerned that his DNA transferred. So his solution or his panic was to, after he maybe moved the bodies or did he maybe transfer and touch these items while he was moving them? Did he go down to the Creek and like dunk them under the water, hoping his DNA or th thumbprints would wash off in the water? Cause to me, it kind of makes sense if there, these three items washed up or got stopped in the same position, it doesn't seem like they would have fallen off their bodies as they were like struggling across the Creek in different areas. But if somebody led all three items at the edge of the Creek at the same time, it seems like they might get stuck in the branch or whatever in the same position. So their clothes obviously came off at some point. So it's like, there has to be some whatever motive related to that. I've heard some rumors about stuff at the crime scene and related to clothes, but I don't want to really spread rumors because I've heard various rumors and they contradict each other. So I'm not going to say one thing and have you guys think it's true or something. Ben says, if Ron knew there was going to be a crime on his property, he would not have driven his car that day. Yeah, no, well, I, I agree with that, but also people think he wanted this 2 p.m. alibi saying that his cousin drove him to the aquarium, which I totally agree that there are a lot of suspicious things in that Ron Logan search warrant that it made me raise my eyebrows. No, I don't have Botox. Um, <laughs> so I can understand that people find a lot of stuff concerning about Ron, but to me, I mean, I just can't get past those items that I referred to before. Charmaine, you're getting some hate mail tomorrow. Hi, Deb's True Crime Notebook is still here. Check out Deb's channel on YouTube, Deb's True Crime Notebook. She wants to get to a thousand, thousand subscribers and she's like 170 away. Let's see. See through Ron's, sorry, read Ron's PCA, or actually his search warrant, I think you're talking about. Look where they put Libby's phone at 213. Those pings seem way off, in my opinion. Ron could have been in the house. All right, a few more Ron comments, and then I'm going to this uh, next major subject. All right, Colt, you're not a DB. Um, I look forward to your comment below where you have more room, uh, room to write a longer comment to share your expertise. Oh my gosh, running out empty. I'm not sure what you even say. Um, hi, Jane from the country. My nickname is I roll of Apophis. That's somebody who hides behind a fake name and fake picture and accuses the family of being murderers and involved. And like Abby's, the photo of Abby on the bridge is photoshopped. I roll. Next. I mean, I try not to say mean things about other YouTube creators because I don't want drama with anybody, but people are accusing the family of absolute BS and it's not cool. Like these people hide behind these channels. If you saw Becky Patty and or Abby's mom, like most of these accusations seem to be, which I mean, I've watched like part of the videos and I rolled my eyes and turned it off. From what I've seen, like they say that Libby's family killed the girls in the bedroom on Sunday or something and that the girls were dead and they staged it to make it look like I mean, I don't even remember. It's so off the wall. If you saw Becky Patty, would you walk up to her and tell her your accusation? So if the answer hopefully is no, why do you feel it's okay to do it on YouTube? I just don't get it. And I, I will say like with an unsolved crime, I do believe everybody needs to be looked into even to every single family member. But at a point it's like, Bitch, you be tripping. All right, next. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so people um, don't think Bridge Guy body and Ron matches up. I'm going to change the subject soon. Give me one second. I'll do three more comments about this. I'm trying to look for comments where people thought Ron 
was bridge guy because i do truly want to give people a chance to give some good reasons problem is i'm not seeing anything and i'm not kidding if i see something i'll highlight it venus says i just want to reiterate one can wonder about his involvement without thinking he is bridge guy that's fine i'll allow that This is totally off topic. Nobody says Rick Allen doesn't have close friends. I don't know that that's true. Who could he chance share his secret with? The secret with? Oh, chance. Are you talking about Rick conspiring with somebody else? I don't know. Some people think Ron and Rick did this together. I don't think so. All right. One more Ron Logan thing, and then we're moving on to this hot topic that nobody's talked about. Let's see. Yeah, people accuse me of making money off of this. YouTube takes 30% out. I have to pay 30% taxes. This microphone costs over $400. It's a Shure SM7B. It's connected to an Apollo Twin Universal Audio, which costs over $1,000. StreamYard, which is helping highlight your comments, costs $240 a year. People ask me to share my files. It's cost me over $300 for a website. So. People who think I'm making money off of these live chats and my videos, it's sorry, you're wrong. I still have the same Taco Bell cup from the past five years. So don't you think I'd buy a new Taco Bell cup? Next. All right, one more Ron Logan thing. Sorry, I'm trying to find something for Ron, but nobody's really saying anything. Um. Sorry, we have to move on with our lives. <laughs> okay, you guys, you're not talking about what everybody's been talking about the past week, which I'm starting off by saying allegedly. All right, back to PowerPoint. Um, Aspen has a friend. All right, sorry. I don't have any friends. All right. We're at the three hour and one minute mark. I will start talking about the stuff that um, people have been talking about the past week. None of this is confirmed, so keep that in mind as I go through this. I'm going to be reading these PowerPoint slides for the next like almost 10 minutes, so you might want to save your comments or um, talk to each other. So again, allegedly. Here we go. Um, I just have this come up because I, this was something that was new to me. So prejudice in a court filing refers to a loss of certain rights or privilege. The rights and privileges have to do with whether the plaintiff will be able to bring the same case to court or file another suit that is based on the same grounds as the one that has been dismissed. So dismissed with prejudice means is it is dismissed with the loss of certain rights or privileges. So the case is dismissed permanently and cannot be brought back to court and the charges cannot be refiled. If it is dismissed without prejudice, the case is only dismissed temporarily. The plaintiff is allowed to refile charges after the claim or bring the case to another court. So why am I talking about this? Brandon Woodhouse has been in the Delphi community online. People are talking about this over the past week and I'm only going to reveal like certain parts of it. We'll, we'll get to this, the thumb, thumb drive later. I'm not showing what it is, but I'll reference it. So Brandon Woodhouse is a guy who's local to Delphi and he has a YouTube channel that he's uploaded a few videos in the past few weeks. And there's a few reasons why I'm talking about it related to Delphi. So his accusations against Carroll County Sheriff and Rick's defense attorneys, Andrew Ball, sorry, defense attorney, Andrew Baldwin. This could be relevant to Rick's trial due to serious accusations against prosecutor McClelland and defense attorney Baldwin. So Brandon Woodhouse had a first lawsuit and I tried to summarize it as short as possible. He was arrested in, I'm gonna try and get these facts right, but um, I'm not saying this is all true, but I, I tried my best. 
He was arrested in 2019 for an assault he said he did not do. It was dismissed without prejudice in May 2021, but he was not ever charged again from what I saw on my case, um, which is the online Indiana court records. He filed a lawsuit against Sheriff Tobe Lesenby, claiming his civil rights were violated in Carroll County Jail. He was denied epilepsy medication, which caused him to have a seizure and fall off the top bunk, which he was forced to sleep on. He said he was given pills that made him sick. And then the jailers in Carroll County put insulin syringes and narcotics around his body and when he was laying in his cell and they took photos. There was also, he said, inappropriate touching of private parts. This is all from his first lawsuit. Um, he said at the courthouse when he was brought there, jailer Randall gave the judge, quote, a stack of photographs and told the judge that Woodhouse appeared to be under the influence. Woodhouse said Randall told the judge that he, sorry, that he, Woodhouse, had picked the lock of the nurse's safe station and then the jail's evidence room to obtain the syringes and narcotics. He suffered injuries, both physical and emotional, various medical expenses, et cetera. And the defendant Woodhouse's ac um, actions, oh no, sorry, the defendant, uh, Tobe Lesenby, actions constitute negligence, assault, battery, sexual battery, intimidation, excessive force, negligent infliction of emotional distress, and intentional infliction of emotional distress under Indiana law. Um, let me just get the, to this real quick. Um, hi, Patricia. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You just triggered four pit bulls, but um, like I said, I'm not getting rich on this. So I took a script, but thank you very much, Patricia. I appreciate you and everybody else who donated. Okay, so this is a screenshot from this order dated December 15th of 2022. Just a reminder, Rick was arrested around October 28th, 26th. So Brandon Woodhouse plaintiff against Carroll County Sheriff Tobe Lesenby defendant order says this matter is before the court on the stipulation of dismissal with prejudice as to defendant Carroll County Sheriff's Department only filed by the parties on December 15th, 2022. A plaintiff, Brandon, may vol voluntarily dismiss an action without a court order by filing a stipulation of dismissal signed by all parties who have appeared, uh, blah, blah, blah. Plaintiff has done so in this case, and the court accordingly acknowledges that all claims against Tobe are dismissed with prejudice. So ordered December 15th. So I believe Brandon in one of his videos said that he settled it and it was in his favor. I might not be totally, I know I should know more, but I just want to, again, clarify, I'm not totally familiar with all this. You are definitely free to go to Brandon Woodhouse on YouTube. That's how you spell his name. And you can see and hear his videos and his more extensive accusations, which I'm getting closer to why it's important to Delphi and some really crazy stuff is coming up next. So on July 7th, 2023, Brandon filed a notice of tort claim. And the summary is he intends to, sorry, it said intends to assert a tort claim against Carroll County Sheriff's Department, Carroll County, Carroll County Jail, and White County Jail Division, White County Sheriff's Office, Mayor Kathy Gross, Mayor Anita Wordling, and Rick's defense attorney, Andrew Baldwin, for, but not limited to, violation of constitutional rights, intentional infliction of emotional distress, due process violations, Eighth Amendment violations, tortious interference, excessive force and battery, ongoing constitutional de deprivations, retaliation, DTPA, I'm not sure what that is, does anybody know, violations, violation of implied attorney-client relationship, which that's very important coming up on the next slide, fraud, inducement, tortious conduct and conspiracy, as well as any other applicable state and federal claims arising out of the tortious conduct of said parties occurring on around December 20, sorry, December 7th, 2022. So why am I talking about this on a Delphi chat? Here we go. So I tried to summarize this as much as possible. So I'm going to read what this says. So this is um, my summary of what Brandon has said. Some of this is from a legal document. Rick's defense. So pay attention. This is allegedly, so Rick's defense, um, Andrew Baldwin, 
contacted Brandon about testifying at Rick's trial, Rick Allen's trial, about the extent that McClelland, the prosecutor, would go to set somebody up and put false evidence to create a false conviction. So Brandon Woodhouse has a long history with um, Carroll County. He's been arrested quite a few times and he's accused them of quite a few um, like bad behavior, to put it mildly. He also said something that I don't have in here, but he said that he was had a relationship with, we know that Shane Evans is the former mayor who is also like under, he's in the um, prosecutor's office under McClelland. So Brandon made a claim that Brandon supposedly had a child with a woman, but he's claims that Shane Evans was also hooking up with her at the same time. And he thinks that he's paying child support for what is actually Shane Evans' son. Also, he says that McClelland is like targeting Brandon because McClelland works with uh, Shane. So that's a whole nother issue. But here is like where the crazy part is. And then it goes to some other part that we'll discuss in a minute. On or around December 7th, 2022, Brandon received a call from Andrew Baldwin, who is Rick's defense, one of Rick's defense attorneys, who was interested in obtaining more information from Brandon about the Brandon Woodhouse versus Tobe Lesenby case. He told Baldwin, so Brandon told Baldwin that he signed a confidentiality non-disparagement agreement during the settlement phase of that case. Baldwin assured him he knew a way around the confidentiality agreement through manipulation of the law. Later, Brandon received an email from Baldwin containing a map of evidence on a thumb drive. However, Baldwin realized he mistakenly sent sealed evidence and asked Brandon to delete it. Brandon forgot about the email for months and didn't hear much from Baldwin afterwards. So two things here. As you guys know, if you're using a certain uh, program for email, if you write the first letter or two of an, a name, an email address, it will autofill. So the other defense lawyer is Bradley Rosie. So it starts with B-R-A and then Brandon starts with B-R-A. So it seems like this supposed map of evidence might, I'm not for sure, but I think it might list um, the, so there's a thumb drive apparently of discovery evidence. And this map of evidence, I'm not sure, but it might be the names of the folders on there. So I don't, I don't know for sure, but this supposed email from December, early December may have been Baldwin trying to send this list of folders to the other defense attorney, Rosie, but it autofilled to maybe um, Baldwin had previously or recently emailed Brandon and Baldwin, Baldwin did not notice that it went to Brandon instead of Brad Rosie. So that's that. That's a huge mess up, let's call that, on the behalf of Baldwin. Again, this has not been confirmed, but I'm just repeating un unconfirmed things. I've heard from two different sources that it did happen, but I'm not sure. So around April 26th, 2023, Brandon had an argument with his brother, leading him to call the police to have his brother removed from the house. Brandon was arrested along with his brother and caregiver. While at Carroll County Jail, Sheriff Liggett mentioned that Brandon would not be there if he hadn't returned home. I'm not sure what that's about. Brandon had to provide his phone password to make a call. Brandon was then transferred to White County Jail and faced escalating bond amounts, ultimately leading to a no bond status. Throughout his time in jail, Brandon endured neglect and isolation, deprived of adequate medical care medication. Despite leaving a trail of documented grievances, he was deprived of recreation time and others were instructed not to communicate with him. So then it gets crazier. Carroll County informed White County that Brandon was being held without bond despite his family having the funds to bail him out. Around May 1st of this year, he was transferred to Carroll County Jail and placed in a dirty cell block by Officer Lori Sustarsik, who had previously been sued by Brandon. Moreover, a seizure experienced by Brandon went unnoticed due to a camera being out of view. Around May 2nd, Andrew Baldwin, Rick's defense attorney, unexpectedly visited Brandon in Carroll County Jail, posing as his attorney to be able to speak with him. Baldwin wanted Brandon to remove the email that he uh, mistakenly sent back in December and YouTube content. 
In exchange, Brandon requested that Judge Fran Gohl, who's in charge of Rick's trial, and the prosecutor be informed of Brandon's cooperation, which from what I've heard, the prosecutor was informed that this happened. Again, this is all stuff from this notice of tort claim that Brandon filed on July 7th. Apparently, the defense and everybody he's suing has 90 days to reply, and then he might do an official lawsuit if they don't settle. Baldwin left the Carroll County Jail to delete the content from Brandon's phones using a different device, which I'm not sure what that means. Baldwin, sorry, Brandon asked Baldwin to meet with his girlfriend and provided a code word to ensure she could verify his safety. Baldwin left and Brandon later confirmed that the requested content had been deleted. As a result of the police's unreasonable treatment, Brandon Woodhouse has suffered from severe mental and emotional distress, among other issues. So I brought that up because there are some serious accusations against Prosecutor Nick and the defense attorney Baldwin, which is this going to affect Rick getting a fair trial? Is this going to have to have McClelland and uh, Baldwin be removed from the trial? I don't know. It's like <sighs> crazy stuff. So the one other thing which I'm not sharing is in the past week, some people have started sharing these screenshots online, which says it's like this map of evidence folders. And I don't know that it's true. So I don't want to start showing these online because I just don't want to do that. And people might be saying, well, why did you just share what Brandon said? I mean, we saw that there was this first lawsuit that was settled and this notice of tort has also been filed and it's, it's online. So we can all make our own uh, judgments, I guess, but that is like the last thing that I have on my list of what people are talking about. So let me see what your reactions are. So we'll talk about this and then I'll do some um, random comments that you guys want to talk about. We're at three hours and 15 minutes and I'm not going over a half hour more. I'm sweating. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Budward Bowen, love your videos. You know your stuff. Don't take this wrong. You kind of remind me of a hostage. Every like 300 people are holding me hostage right now, forcing me to do this live chat. So that's the look I'm going for. Anyway, I won't take offense. I, I don't take myself seriously. And neither does anybody else. One thing. Colt, thank you for your offer, but I'm good. I appreciate that, that you're very thoughtful. Let me wipe my sweat off my face. Um, let's say sorry. I'm looking to see what you guys want to say here. This isn't about what I just talked about. But hi, Daniel. Okay, it's not exactly the most appropriate use of the term, but all the mental gymnastics and have to be used anytime there's a case like this. I can't help but fall back on the principle of parsimony, which. I have not asked my friend Siri for a definition in a few live chats, so it's customary for me to ask her at least one question because I don't know what parsimony means. Hey Siri, what is the definition of principle of parsimony? Oh, I have, on, I have her on mute. One moment, please. Principle of parsimony. Sorry. The principle that the most acceptable explanation of an occurrence, phenomenon, or event is the simplest involving the fewest entities. That's what people say, Occam's razor or something like that. All right. So what's your, what's the simplest thing? Rick went to the trails and he's the only one involved? I don't know. Um, Big solves, you're still here. Thank you to everybody who's still here from the beginning, especially my mods, my moderators. I don't like saying mods. I really appreciate everybody who's a moderator and people who are polite in chat. Hopefully you found this, like Fig said, somewhat interesting. Can we talk about corruption next? 
and how whenever someone runs out of logic and facts, they just cry corruption. Um, I don't have a spreadsheet on corruption. <laughs> Fig, you're going to have to host your own live chat on corruption. Uh, let's see. Any comments about Brandon and what he said? Emily says he's Brandon has never mentioned McCleland in all the records before. He does um, in his YouTube videos. Charmaine says this is insane. Uh, some of you, I think, are behind the video, so your comments don't line up with what we're talking about. You guys are pulling a Tom Webster here, far behind. Excuse me. Colt, I really appreciate your um, very generous offer, but I can pay my bills. But I'm truly not like making a lot of money off this stuff. So anybody who thinks there's a lot of money in true crime with 300 people watching is just not true. Hi, Unabomber. I don't know who you're talking about. Mickey Blankenship. Who's who's that? It sounds familiar. You're really late. This is the first time I've seen your username in three hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm just looking for comments that we haven't highlighted. Kennedy says, but he sent it to another rosy employer too. Uh, Rosie is the other defense team or defense lawyer. I'm not sure. I've never heard of somebody else getting this same email, Kennedy. Can you clarify later on in a comment? All right. That's a good idea to go watch TV and stop watching me. Uh, all right. It seems like you guys aren't, um, well, Fig solves, those screenshots are fake as functionality. Someone made them in Microsoft Word. So yeah, I don't know that they're true or not. So I did not want to highlight them on um, this live chat since like 10,000 people end up watching my live chat. So yes, I show that these are alleged complaints against the prosecutor and the defense in Carroll County, but I just didn't want to show these um, screenshots about potential evidence and there's some names that we have not heard and I didn't want to just show that stuff. So I'm trying to be somewhat responsible. Hi caricature. Hope you, hopefully you guys in Michigan don't get tornadoes and I hope you get to go to, I know you wanted to go to a, Tropical location one day. Hopefully you can go someday. Digital. How many lawsuits has Carroll County settled and sealed? I don't know, but there's some people I'm sure who have a spreadsheet on it, but I do not. Um, hi, Rizé. I think I I've not highlighted your comments, but I don't know exactly what you're talking about. The screenshots. The hostage look works for you. All right, thanks. I'm, that's what I'm going for. Yeah, so um, if you're interested, these screenshots are on Facebook in a uh, group called Delphi Search for a Killer or something like that. So if you want to see them there, that's where, and maybe one other Facebook group, they're floating around. So whether they're true or not, I do not know. So, oh my gosh, you're such a liar. All right, um, like 20 more minutes and then I'll put us all out of our misery. Sub Rosa is saying charges for McClelland. I don't know. It's going to, I think, as I just said, I think with these notice of tort claims, they have three months, which would be October 7th for them to reply to Brandon's charges to settle. And if not, I think is when he will file like an official lawsuit, which at that time it might become more of a news story. He said that he, in his videos, that he's done interviews with like the Carroll County Comet and some local news stations, but I've not seen anything online yet. Um, hi, JW. I'm glad you're still here. 
Big Sauce is sending me an invoice for moderating for three hours and 24 minutes. I promise I'll stop in 20 minutes. Illegally Blonde says, what corruption? Ricky confessed. I, I agree. I mean, there are some people who are very concerned with corruption, and there, I totally agree. I can't say a cursor, but there's some shady S going down in the county or the city. Does that change the fact about what happened on the trails? That's, I mean, we're all here because we want Rick to get a fair trial. We want to hear finally all of us who have been speculating about this evidence for years. We want to finally find out the truth. I've said before that I think most of us, even though we want justice for Abby and Libby, a big thing that keeps us tuning in and thinking about this case every day like I do is because there are so many questions, yet so few answers, and hopefully we'll finally get answers. So just to follow up on Illegally Blonde, Rick showing up on the trails that day and not really having a good excuse in, or scenario to me um, to explain how he gets from platform one to um, a bench Homeboy's got some explaining to do. And also, I think the biggest, sorry, I'm changing something. Um, the biggest piece of evidence is possibly going to be these recordings where if Rick is in, he was in his cell talking to his wife and his mother, so he's not uh, assume, assuming, Tom, don't assume. It makes an ass out of you and everybody in the chat. Um, my point is that he's not like yelling on the phone to his wife. And my comparison is that bridge guy saying, go down the hill. It's probably in a somewhat similar volume as Rick talking on the phone to his wife. So as a jury member, if Slick Nick Mick plays these recordings of Rick confessing to his wife, I know people are triggered exactly what it said. And then he plays down the hill so you have this guy saying i did something involved in this crime and then you play a sim very similar voice saying go down the hill and you have like 20 people get on the stand saying yes i i knew rick and i do believe that is his voice on the phone call to his wife confessing i do believe it's his voice on um the bridge guy audio and i know people are like well if these people recognize rick's voice why did nobody tip him in for years and i agree that's a valid point exculpatory evidence for rick which is good for rick it excuses him from going to jail the owner of jc's bar when he got a wreck when rick got arrested the owner i'm not going to say his name but he said that i felt the burp come in he said that he had listened to the bridge guy audio and he did not think that it matched Rick's voice. And this is a guy who hung out with Rick at this bar and possibly up, excuse me, possibly other places for who knows how long. My reason against the bar owner saying Rick's voice did not match bridge guy is because if you're in a bar, usually there's other people who are drunk, there's music playing. It's this bar where they play pool. So there's a lot of like external noise. So is Rick using the same tone and volume of voice talking to the guy behind the bar as he is trying to sound intimidating to Abby and Libby? So I don't know. My new phrase is time will tell. We're going to have to wait for the trial to see what audio is played. Is there going to be some voice experts saying, yes, it matches Rick and the voice? I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Deb's True Crime Notebook is still here. How many subscribers have you gotten from this live chat? Go subscribe to Deb's True Crime Notebook. Aspen, you are so ridiculous. He put in a Mariah Carey reference here. Hopefully one day, oh no, one sweet day, all of these questions regarding Delphi will be answered. I hope that it's not just a fantasy. You're such a jackass. Sorry. I mean, thank you so much for your thoughtful comment. Emily says in his newest YouTube videos, anybody watched Brandon's previous videos? He is so, oh, sorry. He's so happy and has ghosts and portals of Abby. I, I don't know about that. Um, we have 15 more minutes and I'm just going to do your random comments and then we're all going to get to go. Bye-bye. 
Darlene is sharing tips. A lot of my viewers are going to be committing crimes, so this is good for you to read. Tear the paper into tiny pieces. Let it soak in the toilet till soft and flush. Much better than eating it. All right, thank you so much for the tips. Frick is still in the house. I have like reminders. I'm supposed to be doing other stuff in live chats right now. Um, what are we doing here? Yeah, Rizé, um, I guess I'll highlight this. So I said before, I don't want to share these screenshots, but if you guys want to see them, go on Facebook, search for a killer, Delphi search for a killer. It's a group. And just remember, I'm not saying that pe the people who share them are faking it, but they're not confirmed. So just remember that as you're reading it. But I, I was, to be honest, I was impressed at the level of detail in these supposed folder names, but I'm really gullible and stupid. Discovery Screenshot had Kagan's interview at Grissom Air Force, sorry, Grissom Air Force Base on August 16th. Documents show ISP, Indiana State Police, requested custody on August 19th. All right, thank you. Random stuff for the next, um, how long? Oh. 15 minutes. All right. Thank you, Emily Ann. Samantha says, first impression, Brandon seems like an attention seeker. Anyone can file a tort claim or complaint about anything, and they're not necessarily true. I mean, if I, I know some people don't believe him, but I think he's being, I mean, I found him to be somewhat, I don't want to say somewhat, but I found him to be believable in his recollection of facts, I would say. I, I don't know. I might be proven wrong, but he did settle. I mean, that settlement seemed, or it was dismissed without prejudice, but I believe he said it was settled in his favor and he signed a non, an NDA or non-disparagement agreement. So it leads me to believe that if he's saying, I won't say bad things about, well, he doesn't he say bad things about them later. If I won't say bad things about Tobe, because I signed this thing, doesn't that mean that maybe the, or Tobe said, okay, I was guilty or our sheriff's department was guilty of something. Colt wants to say, can we talk about how there's a good chance Libby was expected to be with her sister, not Abby? It's who she almost always went with. I mean, yeah, they did ask um, Kelsey to go to the trails with them, but she said that she had to go to her boyfriend's before work. So you think maybe Kelsey was the target? I just don't know how Rick would even know that um, these girls would be there other than random girls that, as I was saying before, did this fantasy opportunity finally present itself with two random girls, which happened to be Abby and Libby. Running on empty, do the lawsuits name Rick's defense attorneys? Yeah, Andrew Baldwin. He said that Baldwin mistakenly sent him evidence and then showed up at Carroll County Jail saying that he was Brandon's lawyer because he wanted to make sure that that um, email he, he mistakenly sent got deleted. We're not doing four more hours. I'm not doing four hours total, 12 more minutes. No, not five. <laughs> but thank you for everybody who's still here. We're wrapping this up. Yeah, so my next live chat public is going to be two months from now, probably. Uh, around October 26th and 28th, I will do, I will try to cover as many international time zones as possible. And I will try to have some guests on. So it's not just me putting people to sleep. Um. And I'm sorry for everybody if I missed your comment. I'm I try my best. Thank you, Frick. Susan says this could delay the trial if new attorneys need to be signed. I know it's like I'm concerned, but if these accusations are true, then there need to be consequences for these attorneys.
Meerkat says two things can be true. Rick Allen can be the killer and there can also be corruption in the county. Didn't I just highlight that before? <laughs> Human animal. I've been going so long. You finally were able to make it from Australia. I think that's where you're from. The voice of Allen in the gondola. What did I call it? A ski lift? GPIG? What is that? Down the mountain does sound like down the hill. Oh, yeah. So on Rick's wife's Facebook, as soon as he was arrested, everybody like found it. And I have a screenshot or a video screenshot of what it all contained. And they went on a trip to, I guess it was, mm, what did you say? It was, was it Tennessee? And they're going down this ski lift, also known as a gondola. And what does Rick say? They're talking about a wheelchair or something like that. I feel like I've never really heard a decent audio clip of Rick to definitely say, yes, I believe Rick's voice sounds like bridge guy. However, police brought him in on October 13th and October 26th. So they have very good, hopefully microphone um, recordings of Rick talking in a normal voice. So, I mean, I would think that as they were trying to figure out in September and October, 2022, is Rick truly bridge guy? Don't you think they were like listening to see if his voice seemed to match up to bridge guy? They did not mention that in the PCA, but hopefully at the trial, we will see some more concrete evidence. Does Rick's voice sound like bridge guy? Somebody, I don't know, some, um, some astute researcher called Rick's cell phone in the past, like two months. And his greeting is, I'm going to do an impression. It's not going to be good. Something along the lines of, I, I can't do it. I'll, I'll try, but it's probably not going to be right. Rick. And people thought that Rick sounded like, guys, uh, my honest opinion was that Rick's voicemail greeting saying his name, like the tone and the volume and the delivery of it matches guys. But like the raspiness of go down the hill did not match um, Rick's voicemail, but it's like one word. So I'm not saying either way. Time will tell. Deb's true crime notebook. Are people subscribing to you, Deb? Yes or no? Oh, only five people. I feel like such a failure. Hopefully on the replay, like anybody's going to watch three and a half hours of the replay. <laughs> Eight more minutes. Charmaine, not once is considering, no, sorry. I think you mean no one is considering the possibility that this may not go to trial. He could plead out. I haven't seen much in the way of actual innocence. It seems to be more about Rick's mental state right now. I, I, I agree. That's what the defense seems to be going for. But like, at what point after 10 months, is it not going to go to trial? I was wondering at one point, at, sorry, at what point can Slick Nick Mick say that he's going to try and get the death penalty? And will that induce Rick to say, okay, I'm not risking that. So let's try and get some plea deal. Well, where I'll like have life in prison. I don't know. I think I asked, um, murder sheet to do an episode on like the death penalty and how that can come into play. But I don't know. They're busy playing best fiends. I'm kidding. I have nothing against murder sheet. Maybe they're working on it. I'm sure they're researching it um, <laughs> as we speak. Um, human animal. Well, I will listen to this later. Just popped in on break. I'm sure it has been very interesting. That's debatable. The drama on this case against Judge Gull, et cetera, is crazy. All right. We, we did not really talk about Judge Gull drama. Until tomorrow. Hi, nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a while either. Have you been fine? I guess so. How about you? Have, have you been? Okay. Charmaine. Yeah, I was really triggered by that typo. Are you drinking? Aspen, stop. Hi, M. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Diana, you're ridiculous. Um, <laughs> Tom is a vision of love and a hero to many. Those are two Mariah Carey song titles. Budward, 
troll guy on the bridge reminds me of the travel no travelocity gnome i think that's what you're talking about um oh my gosh that's not true i'm an icon on somebody's desktop um hopefully not um and i think there are two different things and this is a good point Anne says nda equals non-disclosure agreement but i like non-disparagement agreement so I think there are two different things. Disclose obviously means keep your mouth shut. Disparage means um, don't say bad things. Briefly summarize the updates. Dave, I, um, just go to the beginning. Like there's no updates really. <laughs> I've been talking about nothing for three hours and exactly for 40 minutes, five more minutes. That's it. I'm not, I'm not kidding children. Good night, Anne. Yeah, we're, we're wrapping this up real soon. Um, oh, hi, I like turtles. So Rick says on the ski lift to his wife, there's a wheelchair coming up. Yeah, Maggie. Oh, hi, Maggie. I haven't seen you yet, but I think you left a comment on my notice. Yeah, we're, we're wrapping this up. Nobody, I have not heard a closer voice match to Bridge Guy than Rick's. Aspen says that Rick and his wife on this uh, ski lift, I wanted to say ski mask, were in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Speaking of ski mask, um, I emailed Detective Dave Vito and he didn't reply back because it was after Kagan finally got sentenced. I sent an email because I'm nosy, like all of you. And I said, now that Kagan's case is over, can you please clarify if the ski mask incident that you ref that you referenced in August 2020 interviewing Kagan, was that some kind of interview technique or was that an actual incident? Because I know a lot of us have been very discombobulated by if that was true or not. So I was trying to get an answer for you guys and nobody replies to me. So I'm sorry, I'm a nobody around these parts. Hi, Beverly. I'm glad some people find this interesting. It, it went okay today or tonight or this morning, wherever you are. Kelt, yes, hopefully they will have some kind of more um, clear audio s examples and samples to for the prosecutor to try and match up if Rick's voice matches Bridge Guy. It's not Ron Logan, sorry. Um, you're talking about me. Sorry. Pass a debutta. I didn't even read your comment, but I like, oh, pass a debutta. I like your screen name. Thanks for the live tonight. And by the way, I do hope much success for you and that you can make a little jingle. All right. Thank you. Digital. Have Rick's lawyers received all the discovery documents yet? Isn't there a time limit? I do not know. It's been, as I've said before, it's now been, what are we? Today's August 24th. So in two days, it will be 10 months since Rick was arrested. I don't know. There, there's a lot of stuff that they apparently have to hand over. Oh my gosh, it's two minutes left. Oh my gosh, Diana. Any final comments? I will do five more minutes and I swear that's it. <laughs> Just so you guys can do anything final comments oh my gosh betty all i want for christmas is another four more hours all right i appreciate everybody's comments i appreciate everybody's humor during this dark topic i appreciate hopefully most people were polite other than that one hole in the grass um, yeah lara or sorry la loss i did one Long Island serial killer Rex Hurman video where I read the the document came out and I was up until like I worked on it for like 11 or 12 hours straight and finally like 4 a.m. I finally finished it so I just did an overview of the Long Island, Long Island serial killer I might I'm not really planning to do any more videos on that I might do why am I even saying this a 
nightly live stream of Brian Koberger's trial. I have not really followed it that closely, but I did read the PCA and I am interested in to see, to see how that case um, plays out. So it was supposed to be October 2nd that it started, but it was just sweating. Somebody used my sweating emoji with um, the guy from the pilot from airplane movie. I, um, it Koberger's trial has been suspended indefinitely because at, at first he was uh, going for a speedy trial and today or yesterday he waived that right. So, um, oh my gosh. So to be determined when Koberger's trial starts, Babu's Frick will see another live stream from Tom one sweet day. Oh my gosh. In two months, or if something like totally major happens, I will, sorry, my voice is tired. I will try and do a live chat like that night or the following night. Debbie, hi. Debbie just woke up at 5 a.m. in the Netherlands. I'm going to watch this later. Good morning. Just a few more minutes. Caricature contest. Why is your name caricature contest? I've never asked you that. I got three feet of water in my basement and it's storming bad. Uh -oh. You got three feet in one day? But I'm thinking of Abby and Libby and Tom. Rick is so guilty, can't wait for the trial. We'll see, we're not supposed to say he's guilty. We have to wait until the trial. Which some people are like, why is Rick, Rick's wife and his mom still showing up at his court dates? I can see that they want to see all of the evidence in court and hear the witnesses and stuff. I don't know how much access they have to the discovery. I know that Rick's wife has been in contact with the defense team. So I can see that his family, or at least his wife and his mom are not just like, oh, he's been charged. So we're never speaking to him again. I don't know the status of how often Rick is talking to his wife and his mom. So we all heard about this early April confessions to his wife and mom. And it said before that he was talking to them, was it twice a day or I think it was twice a day. I don't think it was twice a week. I think it was twice a day. And it said after that confession where his wife hung up, who knows why, it said that he had not been in contact with his wife or anybody. So does that sound innocent to you? I don't know. It doesn't sound innocent to me. However, that document came out in June. That was the unsealed documents. I don't know. So the date of that document where it said he had not talked to them since that April confession, I don't exactly remember. It may have only been a few weeks. So he could be talking to his family again. Hi, mommy Wolverine. Thank you. Hopefully I made a few people smile today. M wants me to move to Canada. We Italians would appreciate you way more. Grazie, prego. Ma non vado a Canada a presto. Sono stato a Canada. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, how long ago? Say ani fa. Yes, I'm speaking Italian or at least trying. Buona notte. That means good night. And Malgorzata from Poland never shut up. Hopefully she'll watch the replay. I said good evening in Polish at the beginning of the chat, trying to be nice. I said it was stopping at five hours. What else is going on? Or five minutes, sorry. Oh my gosh. No, I need to go to sleep. No response? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Thank you, Aspen Connor, for moderating being here for almost four hours, although he's used to long chats. He, Aspen is on the channel. It's a crime of shame. And he also has his own channel. So search Delphi Aspen Connor. Sorry, I, I didn't promote your um, channel before. I was so busy getting Deb, only five subscribers. Also Fig Solves. Anybody else who wants to promote your channel, I'm fine promoting other people. How are we going to wrap this up? None of you guys are like saying, bye, Tom. You're just keeping asking more questions. Maggie says, friend at 48 hours 
is working Gilgo literally right now. So the CBS uh, TV show, 48 hours, September 16th, it should be out. Watch. All right, I will. Kelt, thank you. This is the first time I caught you live. You are great. And your chat is very kind. Maz, you are. All right, thank you. Thierry, Tom, you're where all the different fighting factions on YouTube revolving this crime can come and enjoy your content with little to no drama. All right. I try to keep it cute, keep it moving. I don't know. I forget. Keep it classy, keep it cute, keep it moving. I did call out like the hate channels about the families, but other than that, I don't care what everybody else does. <laughs> yeah, a poor cult has been waiting like an hour for me to shut up and so we can finally add the comment. I swear, at three hours and 59 minutes, I'm gonna stop. Meerkat, thank you so much for, I guess you've been here most of the time, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I tried to totally avoid Idaho when it happened because I totally get obsessed, as we know. So hopefully I'll catch up on some of the facts before his trial starts. Oh, plead the fifth. Hi, nice to see you. Finally, I solved one mystery. Caricature, caricature contest. Her name is Joanne, but I love to draw caricatures of people. Well, everybody wants to know, does your Tom caricature, is he sweating? and holding up a Taco Bell cup. I'm so embarrassing. All right, I swear, we're less than nine minutes, people. Yes, Airplane is one of my favorite uh, movies ever. So I made an emoji for members. And since I sweat on these live chats, I did a screen capture of the pilot from Airplane where he's trying to land the plane at the end of the movie. And they like poured water on his head, acting like he was sweating. So when I'm sweating, my members can show that emoji. It was, it was supposed to be Italian, but apparently nobody understood it. I don't like to highlight compliments, but I don't want to ignore people. Diana, I appreciate you. I really hope your mom had a nice birthday the, the other day. What are you saying? Thank you so much for being you, having this channel and covering these cases so professionally with that humor and self-deprecating way. You are a treasure and I think you are great. Good night, Thank I appreciate that, you're very nice. Uh-oh, Malgorjata, where were you at the beginning? I'm gonna re redo my thing. I'm gonna embarrass myself for the 29th time. Dobri vi et, wait, hold on. Dobri vi et jer. that was so not Polish. Malgorjata. But now it's morning time. I only learned how to say good evening, not good morning. Oh my gosh, it's morning in Poland. Oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassing. And Tom, you made me smile every show. Everyone show Tom some love. No, it's okay, we're good. <laughs> Seven minutes. I'm stopping at three hours and 59 minutes. 50 mi 59 minutes over <sighs> what I said I would do. I'm working overtime here. Oh, this is somebody's um, YouTube channel. Justice Served Daily is having an anniversary party on Sunday. Please stop by. There will be prizes. All right. I don't really look at YouTube channels or true crime. Sorry. <laughs> Deb's True Crime Notebook. Uh, Diana, you speak Polish? Where are my comments? That's only this, that's only the second comment I've seen of yours, Mal Malgorzata. Maggie is going to dig for Delphi info, hoping they uh, forty eight hours covers it too. Hi, love to hunt. I haven't seen you in a while. Louise, does anyone have knowledge of the scout's cabin in Riley Park? I do not. Um, maybe, I don't want you to come back and check comments, but maybe at some point another viewer will see and write a comment. Thank you, until tomorrow. 
Roll Tide. Oh my gosh, that was horrible. I can probably say Roll Tide in Polish. Uh, five, five more minutes. Hi, Pammy. Nice to see you. JW, Tom, you didn't moan like usual, like you usually do, about how far behind in the chat you are. That's because this time I tried to um, keep up with the more current comments. Yeah, I didn't say that. I only said like 10, my worst was 10 minutes behind. That was like five hours ago. Thank you for waking up early, but we were waiting for you last night in the middle of the night. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you, S Jab. No, I mean, thank you, but we don't like to live stream. Yes, Melissa, it's almost four more minutes. I fell asleep for a bit. I told you I put people to sleep. Uh-oh, you're pregnant. Good luck with your child. Thank you, Betty. Diana's parents were Polish immigrants. Thank you, Colt. I, I really appreciate all your comments that you've left under my videos. Lizbeth, do you regularly do lives or uploads for members? No, it's not worth becoming a member. Like I, I keep it real. Um, they're two ninety nine a month, and for people who say I make money off of it, YouTube gets thirty percent, and the government gets thirty percent in taxes. So for every membership, I get like a dollar a month. And I, at this point, I'm only doing Delphi live chats for members um, on the third Saturday of every month around one o'clock Pacific for Eastern time. I only made the memberships because there were trolls in previous live chats and I was gonna stop totally doing public live chats, but people asked me to continue and it seemed like the only way to stop trolls like who were in my earlier public live chats was to do memberships, which people had suggested. And at first I was doing like four member live chats per weekend and like only a few people were showing up. so. Right now, there's like 20 people who show up for these member-only live chats, and honestly, it's not worth it. But I was going to stop doing the mem memberships, and people asked me to continue them. So they're not a way for me to like make money off of dead children for people who have that complaint. Two minutes. Get in your last comments real quick. Dave Rolltide. Running on empty, absolutely no Missy Beavers case updates, unfortunately. Thank you, Caricature. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm going to end fairly quickly here. Money, oh, sorry, money. Oh, my gosh, what's on my mind? Money, obviously, Tom, you only do these live chats for money. Mommy Wolverine, thank you for the super sticker. I really, I really appreciate it. Hi, Danielle, thank you. All right, we're at the end comments. Less than two minutes. Any final comments? Hi, Fibro. Nice to see you. Going to eat cold chicken tonight. Oh, my gosh. Anything else? We're at 357. Less than two minutes left. Again, thank you for everybody for joining. I truly appreciate your comments, the moderators, anybody who donated money. What else? Yeah, so... Oh, I might have a interview with somebody, a media person in like maybe a month or so. So you might want to look out for that. Um, that's all I'll say at this point. Yeah, so I'm ending this right now. We're at 3.58. I'm going to wait till it gets to 3.59. The next live, ouch, my shirt is like glued to my back with sweat. Oh my gosh, what a great way to end a live chat. Um, October 26th, 28th, around the one year anniversary of Rick getting arrested. I'll do a live chat for people who are in the comments below. I felt one final burp coming on. Um, feel free to write who you would want me to have on as a guest for my October live chats. There we go. I average, I met my quota of five burps per live chat. Three hours and 59 minutes and six seconds. I have to stop this before it gets to four hours. 
thank you everybody i survived another live chat hopefully you found it interesting and i'm gonna just click it off now thank you i'll say goodbye in the comments but the video is going bye bye